Good evening. I'm calling the April 29th, 2020 Select Board meeting to order. Uh, first, a few logistics. The first one being getting the slide to move. <laughs> uh, we're being broadcast on RCTV, Verizon Channel 33, Xfinity Channel 22. Also available on Facebook Live, the link you can get from RCTV. Um, this is a virtual meeting to model and exhibit proper social distancing, of course. We are accepting public comments by email. Please send an email to selectboard at ci.reading.ma.us. We will try to monitor comments during the meeting. And for the public comments, uh, we ask that you include your full name and address, no disparaging comments. Please limit the size and content of your email so that it can be read in less than two minutes. We are always open to suggestions on how to improve our meetings and, and participation. Uh, the Town of Reading is working hard to provide resources to the community, especially for those who are hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Please reach out if you need help, uh, are willing to help, or have questions. The emails and phone numbers are all listed here on this slide. Once again, I want to thank all the first responders and other essential workers that are working so hard to help us survive and thrive in this crisis, if thrive is the right word. We will get through this together. All these folks are, are, are true heroes for us. Um, I want to briefly mention that next Wednesday, uh, May the 6th, is National Nurses Day. I'd like to give a shout out to all of our town and school nurses. Thank you so much for your service to the town and to nurses who live in town, work in town, assist people from town, and in fact, all nurses. Thank you all very much. Tonight, in terms of agenda, we have our state legislative team. Uh, Senator Jason Lewis, Representatives Rich Haggerty and Brad Jones are joining us. I'll ask them to speak momentarily right after we walk through the rest of the agenda. Um, please feel free to email questions that you may have for our legislative <coughs> team. Uh, after the team speaks, they'll be followed by presentations on our COVID-19 response. Uh, first from Emmy Dove, Chair of the Board of Health, and then many members of the command team will be offering updates. We will then have public comment, followed by a final re review of the liaison assignments. Next, we'll discuss the RMLD dividend payment and renewal of the 20-year agreement. Uh, Vanessa and Karen will lead us in the discussion, and John Stempek, the chair of the RMLD commissioners, uh, is on uh, in the meeting with us, and he'll join us for that discussion as well. We'll then talk about future uh, meeting topics, approve meetings, uh, approve some minutes, talk about some minutes, um, and then we will go from there. Uh, so with that, let me first introduce Senator Jason Lewis, uh, who will be followed by uh, Representative Haggerty and then Representative Jones. I shared a few questions with these folks, and I know they have their own comments. Again, if the public has questions for them, please email them to us. Hopefully they can uh, answer some of those questions. Senator Lewis, please. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, good evening, uh, select board members and town leaders and members of the community. I hope uh, that you and, and your loved ones are all safe and well. And I want to echo what uh, um, the uh, chairman uh, just said in terms of um, our gratitude for our uh, Reading first responders, for our local public health staff, for our medical professionals, and all of our frontline workers who are doing extraordinary work um, during this uh, crisis. Um, you, you have our profound uh, gratitude. Um, at the state government level, um, myself and Representative Jones and Representative Haggerty and our colleagues uh, working very closely with uh, Governor Baker and his team um, we've been pursuing what I would describe as kind of a two-pronged um, strategy to deal with this crisis. First is that we are uh, taking a lot of steps, as you're well aware, to contain the spread of the virus and minimize um, hospitalizations and deaths. Bottom line, this is all about um, saving lives in our communities and in, in Massachusetts. And I really... Um, uh, and I know, uh, and we all know, that the steps we've been taking around physical distancing and, um, and hygiene and many others are, are really making a difference. And um, our local hospitals are doing a great job preparing for the surge and managing through it so that everyone who needs uh, care, whether it's for COVID-19 or for another uh, uh, health emergency, you know, is able to get the care that they, that they need. And we're going to continue to take these steps to minimize the spread of the virus. The second strategy that we've been pursuing is to mitigate as much as we can the devastating economic impact 
that this crisis is having on our communities, um, on our residents, on our small businesses, our nonprofits, our municipalities, and others. Um, our state government and our federal government, you know, have been working hard, and we've taken um, numerous actions to uh, seek to address the crisis. Let me just quickly highlight a few of these, and I'm sure the other members of the delegation um, who've worked hard on many of these pieces of legislation will uh, touch on them as well. First of all, um, unemployment benefits have been strengthened and expanded um, to an unprecedented degree, actually, so that virtually um, all workers who are laid off or furloughed or see their or earnings reduced um, can access assistance through unemployment benefits. We've also taken a lot of steps to try to help our small businesses, um, obviously our restaurants and our nonprofits and others um, that have needed emergency assistance as well. Um, emergency funding has been provided for public health purposes, for hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare providers. We've also provided um, le uh, legislation to help our cities and towns to give you budgeting flexibility, permitting relief, um, and the ability to postpone the uh, spring uh, town elections and town meetings. We extended both the state and federal tax filing deadlines, placed a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures for uh, renters, homeowners, and also for small businesses as well. Um, liability protections for healthcare workers during this crisis. Uh, we also took action to cancel uh, MCAS testing for the remainder of the school year. We heard loud and clear from our teachers and parents and superintendents about that. We also authorized electronic notarization for real estate and other business transactions. Um, and that's important uh, for those sectors of our economy to continue to function. We know there's a lot more we need to do working in partnership with you all. Um, so some of the things we're doing are further work to protect the residents and staff in our nursing homes and other facilities that house vulnerable populations. We're looking at ways to strengthen this, our social safety net for low-income families. Um, we are working on legislation right now that I hope we will have done next week that will enable Reading and other towns to hold remote town meetings uh, in the spring if you so, if you so desire. Um, we're also working on legislation to enable more um, options for voting by mail and uh, early voting and to protect poll workers for the fall elections, um, the September 1st prim state primary and the general election. And we know that um, you, um, uh, in, in case there is going to be a municipal special election in the summer in Reading, we know that we need to also in include um, the flexibility uh, for, that you need for, for that election as well. Um, and then uh, uh, lastly, just wanted to mention that the Education Committee, and I'm, I chair that committee in the Senate, is, is going to be holding a special oversight hearing next week, Wednesday, to understand better how remote learning is going across all of Ma um, uh, districts in Massachusetts. So members of the public are welcome, will be welcome to tune in, and we should be able to learn a lot about the successes and the challenges we're facing to educate our students um, while our schools are closed. Just uh, wanted to wrap up um, with giving you a brief budget outlook, um, and I'm sure um, Representative Jones um, will, uh, and Representative Haggerty will have more to say here. For the current fiscal year that we're in right now, fiscal year 20, we don't expect any um, 9C budget cuts. We think we have the capacity to manage through the shortfall in state revenues for this fiscal year. For the next fiscal year that starts July 1st, fiscal year 21, um, I cannot uh, sugarcoat it. Um, the outlook is, is grim. Um, the normal budget process is delayed um, probably by several months um, over what it would typically be. The uh, House and Senate and the uh, Baker administration held a new consensus revenue hearing on April 14th. We essentially had to restart the state budget process. And according to the experts who testified, the state can expect a revenue loss in the next fiscal year of anywhere between four and six billion dollars compared to what we were expecting just, just prior to the pandemic. That's about a 13 to an 18 percent reduction in state uh, revenues. So that is dramatic. I mean, that's put that in context, that's uh, quite a bit more than uh, during the Great Recession uh, about a decade ago. 
These experts also expect that the unemployment rate in Massachusetts could reach as high as 20 percent, uh, which I think we all recognize is 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 just uh, devastating. Uh, we haven't seen an unemployment rate that high in any of our living memories. The state's rainy day fund um, will help, and it's great. It's very uh, a good thing that the state has been prudent in our budgeting over the last decade. Um, but the big unknown right now is how much additional assistance we will be getting from the federal government uh, for the state and for our cities and towns. Uh, we're expecting that to be included in the next federal stimulus bill that Congress is working on. And I really want to thank our congressional delegation. They've fought hard for us and for all the, all the many needs that are out there. But we really need them to come through in the next federal stimulus bill to provide funding for states and municipalities. So that is a big unknown still right now. We hope to provide more guidance to Reading for your budgeting process um, and to our other communities regarding what you can expect in chapter 70 aid for schools and also unrestricted local aid. Those are the two big local aid accounts. Um, we know that's critical to help you build your budget. So as soon as we have more information, the delegation We'll certainly provide that uh, uh, to you, and we're hopeful to be able to do that within within the next month. So I'll just wrap up by saying that the um, partnership between local government and our state government, you know, is always important, but it's more important than ever. I think we would agree in these uh, very uh, difficult times, and uh, we I know we'll all continue to work closely, continue to work closely together to first and foremost keep our residents safe and to mitigate as much as we can the economic hardship uh, from this pandemic. Um, thank you again for um, this opportunity to join you this evening and happy to take questions. Jason, do you want to take questions directly or should we um, hear from the representatives first? I, th I think probably maybe hear from the other uh, members of the delegation and then maybe we can take questions together. Great, that sounds great. Brad, do you want to uh, lead off? Sure. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join you tonight. Um, I think Jason touched on a lot of the highlights. Um, I would say that I think one of the, the critical decisions that we made um, in the Commonwealth uh, was, you mentioned the Rainy Day Fund, and that has already been kind of given accolades to Massachusetts that we're in um, a better position, although no state's probably in a great position, but that we're in a far better position to um, deal with some of the impacts that we're going to see on a revenue front. Um, I think next week we'll probably get the the first full glimpse of the bad news is as April's revenues uh, come in. And while we've put off the tax filing deadline um, to July 15th for the state, uh, obviously we're, we've seen in every, basically every other category of income, uh, whether it's sales tax, uh, meals tax, hotel, everything down. Um, so that'll give us a first kind of full month glimpse. Uh, March revenues were a little stilted because some of those are, are collections that came in in February that are recorded in March. So that's going to be uh, the first thing. And I think as Jason touched on, um, we've obviously seen the federal government step in in a couple of areas. And I know there's at least one more, hopefully big um, aid package that's being discussed, which has hopefully uh, a sizable amount of money uh, set aside for states and municipalities to hopefully backfill some of that shortfall in revenues. But as I think he said, you, you can't sugarcoat it. There's, there's, no, um, there's, only, there's no good news out there. Uh, depending on what the federal government does, it only makes the bad news a little bit less bad. Um, but our rainy day fund is, um, you know, a, a very healthy uh, number. That's critical. Um, we have passed, I think, as Jason said, a number of pieces of legislation uh, that are sort of, let's say, have some municipal focus in parts. Uh, we've done a tremendous uh, amount on the unemployment, not only from traditional unemployment and, and, and accessing that system, but because of some of the federal um, expansion, building a whole new platform that just went online uh, about a week ago and has had hundreds of thousands of people sign up. Um, and and to, to put it in context, to take an agency that about two and a half months ago had 50 people working in it, taking maybe seven or 8,000 claims in a week, is now an agency that's shifted over and have about, about 1,000 people working seven days a week, um, dealing with hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of claims. Uh, and, and up to the point where I think they were making now like 10,000 10, calls back a day to try to get back to people to make sure they had the right information to make sure they were filling the right date and um it's truly been you know and that's just a glimpse of the herculean effort in one aspect and you, i was on a phone call with uh dcf workers who were trying to make sure uh, children uh, in need are, are protected and and they're every much uh, on the front line too going into homes and dealing 
DDS workers dealing with group homes, um, people that are dealing with SNAP benefits. Um, so they're part of the frontline workers along with our, our police, our fire, our nurses, our medical professionals. Uh, and it's amazing. And, you know, I know there's a concern about the, 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 the uh, PPE. And obviously we had an inadequate supply and, and that's how we had an inadequate supply and a small universe that needed it. And now we have an expanded universe that needed it. Um, and while supply is maybe better than where it was, certainly, uh, and we've seen some great uh, companies in our Commonwealth adjust and get into the manufacturing of something they probably never even envisioned making uh, and are now, you know, staffing up, gearing up in our, our and I think sort of wherever we're headed, that's going to become a permanent part uh, or at least a fixture in our, our life going forward for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, you know, I know there's some concern about the election. I know Jason touched on it. I know there's an election bill being talked about. The Secretary of State has his thoughts. I think he's weighing in and filing a piece of legislation in a few weeks. We have some special state elections underway right now for some vacant legislative seats that are kind of experimenting with. We expanded um, sort of how absentee ballots could be applied. Uh, we let a, a sort of a mail-in and enhanced uh, early voting. So I think some of the experiences of that may be replicated for the fall. Um, I know the mail-in is an issue that we probably have to get around and how that's handled. Uh, I'd like to have a discussion, quite frankly, with our town clerks and how that's all going to work. Um, you know, there just there's so many different aspects to this. Uh, you know, and there's so many tr you know tremendous, wonderful stories of people coming forward in the community, in the Commonwealth, and uh, the country. Um, you know, that it, it's good to have a delegation that works together. You know, I'm in touch with, with Bob and 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 the chief. Um, and whenever, you know, I, I'm needed or if they need anything, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and that goes to, for anybody in the community, we've had sadly, um, you know, dozens of people in the community reach out for, uh, issues that they've had to deal with with the state. Some of them traditional issues dealing with the registry of motor vehicles, but most often unemployment questions. Um, and obviously work continues on, on route 28. And we know that's generated some, some questions and issues in the community as well. Uh, and people haven't been shy about expressing their opinions. Um, so, uh, again, available for any questions. Uh, I do think that that uh, we want to get you some numbers real quick, but I, I would certainly say whatever whatever predisposition you have to be relative to conservative budgeting, uh, it's probably a good year to double down on that. Um, and I don't say that to be alarmist, uh, but having been a municipal official, I know it's a lot easier to add back in than it is to take out after the fact. Um, and we kind of sort through um, a million good ideas that we have right now. There's, there's dozens of pieces of legislation that when we read them, they sound good. Um, most of them all cost money, and we have to match those desires up with our resources, figuring in what the resources we get from the federal government are, what are the resources we have at the, at the state level, resources at the municipal level, and, and try to patch that together and have those two lines meet in a place that's... Uh, sustainable while meeting the most critical needs of, of the people of the Commonwealth and our communities. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the, the camera back, I guess. Thanks, Brad. Um, Rich, can we ask you to make some comments, please? Sure. Thanks so much to everybody for uh, your continued good work and uh, particularly the public safety officials who've been working so hard over the course of uh, particularly the last few months here uh, during these unprecedented times. I won't uh, give the full synopsis uh, again. I think that uh, both the Senator and uh, Representative Jones accurately kind of described what the state has been going through. And I know you all uh, are doing your work following uh, kind of what we're doing and, uh, and communicating with us, letting us know what you need. Um, I will say just as a former local official, something that uh, you know, I've been talking with folks uh, about is uh, you know, the important role that supplemental budgets could play uh, in the coming year uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, we are being conservative with our budgeting measures over the course of the next several months and that uh, you, know, you are going to be able to add back in uh, you know, uh, resources, uh, hopefully, as the economy begins to rebound. And I think the state's going to take a real serious look at adding more supplemental budgets in uh, as we get a better picture of what we're looking at from a financial standpoint of view. As Jason said, you know, when you're talking about four to six billion dollar hole uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the feds are going to have to come to the table. Uh, they're going to have to step up. They're going to have to write a check uh, and support our efforts here uh, because, uh, you know, without that, then uh, the picture is going to be that much more dire. Uh, so I think we're going to get a better picture of that over the course of the next several weeks, uh, I think, as the feds uh, hopefully dig in. Uh, and then beyond that, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of the services that our offices have been providing. And I think that, you know, we've been 
in constant communication with a lot of different uh, folks in the community, whether it's helping with UI benefits or whether it's helping uh, businesses even navigate many of the federal programs through the SBA. Um, you know, that's a real big part of making sure that we're in a position to have our economy rebound uh, and uh, and come back in a manner uh, that, uh, you know, is able to get us back uh, kind of with our feet underneath us. And Massachusetts is well positioned, right? Uh, we're a state that's, uh, you know, competitive in so many different areas, particularly life sciences, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, and others. And uh, because of that, fortunately, I think that once we get past this, I think Massachusetts is going to respond and, and be in a better position than most other states. Uh, so that's that's some good news for us to be looking at. And uh, and again, we are seeing some positive things happen out there in our communities. And, and I see it in Reading you know, all the time as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, people are responding, people are, are contributing. And uh, so as challenging as these moments are, I would mention that, uh, you know, we are seeing a lot of positive things. And I think that we should all continue to, uh, to look, at, look for those as we, uh, as we deal through these challenging times. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Rich. Um, board members, any questions for legislators here? We either answered everything or bored you to death. <laughs> <laughs> Never known you all to be shy. Well, you got my questions in advance, so <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> Karen, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and we really appreciate how hard you're working for us. Um, and I know you're having to do this from many different angles. Um, one of the things I was wondering that I didn't hear any of you mention was whether um, there's any legislation to expand testing. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could get some help, um, just like we give seniors and other community members flu shots? Is there any talk about spending money on testing and helping communities do a much larger job of testing, or are we thinking that's going to be through your primary care doctors? Anyone want to tackle that? Well, I can just say, I'm happy to at least make a few comments anyways. I think that, you know, while those conversations, I think, have a time and place, I think that one of the things we're, that at least that I've, you know, read quite a bit about is, is some of the, um, you know, that a lot of these tests that are out there right now are insufficient. They don't, they don't really do the job, uh, particularly the antibody testing. And that's something that we want to make sure that if we're going to be spending money on, you know, increased testing across the board, that, uh, that in fact, we're not getting uh, false positives uh, and that we're not sending, uh, getting bad data. Uh, we want to make sure we have the best data available to us to be able to actually make informed decisions. Um, and I mean, you know, I will say, obviously, the partners in health effort that's going on right now with regards to tracking, that's ramping up. And I think that's a real positive. I think that that's going to give us a much better idea of, uh, of who, it, in fact, uh, is infected. Uh, of course, and uh, and who they've been in touch with, and that's going to provide uh, an enormous amount of data to better understand uh, where uh, where COVID nineteen is and, and where it's going, how it's being moved around, all of those things. So I think that the uh, that effort is really really important to kind of how we tackle uh, this disease. I would I would only add, Mr. Chairman, that the the, the testing, you know, it seems like it, it's hard to remember what day it is, but you know, back even a few weeks ago. When you know testing was a couple hundred tests a day, now we're approaching nine, ten thousand tests a day. Um, so I would I would agree, uh, Karen, that you know the goal needs to be uh, increased testing. Uh, and obviously, the first place was people that were high risk and people that were on the front lines. But expanding that out. But as Rich said, you want to make sure you have a testing regimen that's that's scalable, affordable, and reliable, so that you're not getting false positives and false negatives and creating the false sense of of security in the expanded testing is one of the reasons why sometimes you see the numbers jump all over the place you know you test a high risk population the numbers are high but as you kind of go out and uh and maybe start to reach into a uh, part of the public that maybe not as high risk those numbers can come down um that's going to give us more reliable data about where we're at truly in dealing with this this pandemic uh, but i would agree i think it's a valid point um i think it's something clearly we were interested in you know the part of the problem originally was part of testing was these swabs and some of the materials from the, from the swabs were in short supply, and, and now that's kind of ratcheting up. Um, you know, some of the places we relied on for some of these things were, were China and Italy, uh, you know, which are obviously kind of the beginning of the pandemic and then the country that sort of led the way of creating the idea of how bad it could really be. Um, so I think we're trying to create, you know, some of the lessons from this is hopefully going forward, having a um, home-based 
re reply uh, and ability to deal with this and not necessarily saying we have to be reliant on for some of these critical things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, foreign sources, or at least make sure you have a stockpile um, that's a little bigger than it was. Thank you. Ann, did I see? Sorry, I caught you with a, a glass in your hand. Did I see you had your hand up, Ann? Uh, no, I think I was uh, going to comment that, that Karen had her hand up. Oh, great. But and I see Carlo. Thank you for the delegation for being here. Yeah, thanks. Carlo, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for coming, gentlemen. Uh, Senator Lewis, you mentioned that uh, important meeting on the 14th when they were crunching the numbers, uh, the four to six billion, the unemployment. How often does that team plan to meet to update and revise, because I'm guessing the states are gonna get one lump check. I'm sure they're gonna do it, are they gonna do it quarterly? Are you gonna to talk to the congressional and, and US senators? Like how often are we gonna get updates on you know, how bad it is? Uh, I, I don't mind jumping in, Mr. Chairman, I'll defer to Jason, if you, but I no, also, ahead, in terms of federal funding and and, and that, you know, some of the money comes in into different buckets. Uh, and I think we're going to get, once we start getting, you know, April's full picture, um, and then hopefully we're able to tie that into, um, by the time we get into, into you know, mid-May, mid, uh, mid -May, uh, a plan for hopefully gradual reopening, um, that we'll get to see those kind of lines and see what we really, uh, what we really have locally, so to speak, statewide. Um, but also a better idea of federal money. And some of that federal money may flow directly through to cities and towns. Some of it may through, flow through to um, different specific, like let's say EOPS that deals with um, you know, public safety, National Guard issues. Uh, it may through, flow, flow through public health. Um, there's a bunch of different areas that it may flow uh, through either directly or through the state uh, that can pass through. Some of it may be reimbursing identified expenditures. So obviously I'm sure your finance team is trying to track everything that was things that otherwise would not have been spent but for dealing with the pandemic uh, and trying to identify those. I know, this, I know the state is. Exactly. And, 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 and the point I was uh, just trying to make was, you know, in an ordinary year, back in December, so this was, would have been last December, the, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the uh, Baker administration, you know, come together have a process where they hear from economists and other experts. And that's all about trying to figure out how much revenue the state can expect in the next fiscal year in order to build its budget. And that's the way it, it always works. And the fact that we have to essentially throw that all out, you know, because everything's up in the air now and there's so much uncertainty we're in a new world. We basically had to restart that process on April 14th, which is unprecedented. So that was the point I was trying to get across is this is, this is really not something we've seen before that we had to sort of throw, tear up the work that had been done over the last four months to start building a state budget for the new fiscal year, which begins July 1st. And we had to re, you know, restart that process you know, mid-April. And now that now we're working uh, to try to figure out, you know, again, what, what can the state expect in, in revenues, sales, re sales tax, income tax, and so on. And then we'll be able to build a state budget and determine, you know, again, how much local aid in chapter 70 you know, and all the other, you know, important uh, services and programs that, uh, that, we, that we need to fund. So that, that's the what only, I was trying to uh, explain. The only exclamation point I would add on to that, Jason, is we're also, you know, unlike, let's say, a natural disaster, you know, a big snowstorm where you feel like there's a, a defined beginning and a defined end, um, right. th there's no end, there's no period on this problem yet. So it makes it very hard or that much harder to kind of identify, quantify uh, the magnitude of the problem. Um, and then obviously the speculation about, well, if you come out too soon, do you have a reoccurrence? Is there a reoccurrence in the fall? Um, what are the things that you need to do to avoid those? So unfortunately, um, you know, we're not going to have that clearly defined end point as well as an end point that doesn't probably mean that everything, you know, the new normal is different than the old normal. Yeah, that's a really important point. Vanessa, go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Um, Jason, Rich, Brad, I just want to thank you for being here. It's, it is helpful to hear directly from you. Um, my question is, one of the things I raised early on with our town manager is that the biggest expense that residents have um, that, that goes to, to the town is our property taxes. And would it be possible for the town to create some kind of deferment of payments for those that are 
um, find themselves unemployed and, and struggling to make those payments. And what I learned is that there are significant limitations on what the town can individually do, that much of that is, is um, structured by the state or in, they're dictated by the state. Uh, are any efforts being made to allow towns to create their own programs or to broaden what exceptions might be for programs for delaying property taxes? Uh, I personally I will have to take a look at it. Vanessa, I don't know of anything off the top of my head other than, you know, we sort of kind of delayed paying the taxes and this and that. Um, but obviously, we would probably have to look at some kind of a, of a program, sort of like, you know, Reading's tax deferral that might be customized to Reading or maybe something that's a little more a la carte that you pick and do certain things. But obviously, it creates potentially a cash flow situation on the municipal level, depending on how aggressive or generous uh, a community is with that. Um, obviously, as Jason touched on earlier, we did an evictions and foreclosures piece, and, and, and hopefully, you know, obviously that may not relate into property taxes, but um, the idea being that, you know, it, it is certainly worth looking at. Um, but to the extent that's a program that requires a state to say, well, we'll provide upfront money so you can provide that relief, um, the state's ability to sort of embark on new, new areas of, of, of cost is going to be beyond limited. I do think there's some merit depending. I mean, obviously you guys have a reserve. I, I had this conversation earlier that in terms of doing your own municipal budgeting, you know, people who can't pay their property tax bill, and I think there's usually an amount of reserve for overlay and abatement and whatever the account was, as I recall, there's some sort of built in, okay, some people aren't going to pay. That may be a number that you carry at a higher number, which doesn't ha doesn't help you budgeting wise, um, but does recognize there's going to be some increased number in the community that are going to struggle. Um, but I think it's worth, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, we'll take a look and see if there's something out there, either in, yeah. in the, it, it's either underway in Massachusetts maybe that some other state has come up with and certainly if you find something please feel free to send it along yeah i would just i would just add just a this is a really important point to find different ways to give relief to our to our residents um given the very tough times they're going through i just wanted to remind folks the um municipal legislation that the state uh, passed governor baker signed um maybe now three weeks ago or so did give um towns the ability to to at least push back the uh uh the, would it be the q2 i guess um it, it would be the may it was the may 1st a uh, due date for property taxes to push that back under local option and also to waive any um you know uh, penalties or, or uh, interest if if somebody did pay late so we did actually include some relief in that in that bill and i believe reading uh, you adopted that right local yeah. option yeah. but i know you're asking about going beyond that and we will take that back that's uh that's good feedback see if there's any options. Thanks very much. Any other questions from the board? Not seeing any. Um, I don't see any public questions at the moment either. Uh, if the public has any questions they'd like to, to share, please send them in by email now. Mr. Chairman, just as a moment, just a, a, a shout out to the first responders writing. I know you had a terrible fire at uh, Meadowbrook. Uh, and um, it's a tragedy, but it was uh, incredible to see the amount of mutual aid that arrived on scene. And, and, and Chief Clark, because I didn't want to interrupt Chief Burns, was kind enough and to see, um, you know, the communities I represent all there, but far beyond that, uh, responding to that situation. And, and obviously a, a terrible situation for Reading and Meadowbrook. Fortunately, no injuries or loss of life. Um, but in, I think that was um, symbolic of the coming together. Uh, in difficult times that we see on a routine basis um, through the communities I represent throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but I think it was, uh, I just wanted to mention and say thanks for a job well done. That's great. I will just, I, I do just want to add a couple of things. So, you know, I think it's very helpful for us to hear from everybody uh, within town government about uh, you know, some of your concerns and whatnot uh, as, as pieces of legislation. I mean, right now they're moving pretty quick, but, uh, you know, as we, you know, as an example, vote by mail, uh, where people are at on that and, and what does that look like uh, for Reading? What are some of your concerns specifically about uh, what that would look like and how that would be managed? Uh, so somebody like the town clerk talking with us about that and, and expressing that to us is important. Um, and, you know, if there's other tools that you think you need in your toolbox uh, that we're not thinking of, uh, let us know about that. Reach out, uh, communicate, and we'll do whatever we can to try to make sure that you've got what you need in order to get through this. 
I think that you know a lot of folks have you know, used the, the term uh, you know, kind of everything's on the table right now. So this is an opportunity to kind of uh, throw some things against the wall and say, hey, let's let's see if this can work right now. Is this something that's a good idea uh, that could work for for Reading or for perhaps other municipalities as well? So uh, just keep that communication flowing uh, and uh, and keep us posted. Will do. I guess so. Thanks to to the three of you uh, for coming tonight, but uh, even more broadly for working together so well for the town of Reading. We really appreciate that. Uh, we most certainly uh, have some needs and we will not be shy in sharing them with you, but I think we've given you a flavor of some of them now. Um, and even though times are very uncertain uh, and we appreciate other communities are facing the same things, um, we all need to work through this together. So we appreciate staying in close touch with you folks. So thank, thank you. you. Our pleasure. You are, thank you. You are more than welcome to stay for as long as you choose in the meeting, but we appreciate you have other, other uh, communities that you represent and need to take care of as well. So we thank you very much for joining. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next on our list, I think we'll go to the COVID-19 update from Board of Health. Uh, so Emmy, would you like to take over from here? Sure. Uh, so I'll start by um, giving an update on our current numbers in Reading. So currently our uh, cumulative cases is 219 of those 142 are active, 67 have recovered, and there have been 10 deaths. Um, I did want to mention that the state actually allows um, long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities to request partial or full facility testing once. Um, two facilities in Reading have done that, and that has accounted for some of the jumps in numbers that we've seen over the last couple of weeks for those of you who have been watching the numbers. Um, I also want to note that the actual number of cases, this has been stated before, but the actual number of cases in the general population is likely much higher than what is reported um, due to mild or no symptoms and lack of access to testing. Um, so I think as most people are aware now, the, the major action we took uh, recently was to put in place an order requiring face coverings in public buildings. This order was based on CDC and state guidance. The CDC guidance came on April 3rd and the state guidance followed shortly thereafter. Uh, this was based on the likelihood of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. It's very difficult to assess um, how, uh, how significant asymptomatic transmission is um, because we aren't testing asymptomatic individuals. Uh, right now, we are seeing them in the long-term uh, care facilities and the uh, assisted living facilities, at least asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So uh, there's a chance that there will be data coming out of that actually. Um, why did we make the decision to take it from an advisory to an order? Data. Uh, so I have been working for the last 20 years in infectious disease research. Uh, this is my wheelhouse. I've been spending a lot of time uh, looking through data and publications. And what I've noticed is that um, there's been mounting evidence over the last two weeks that suggests pre-symptomatic transmission may be a significant driver in the spread of disease. We've seen this in um, uh, papers in Nature Medicine. There was an article recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, among others. And there was a recent report out of Brigham and Women's Hospital, where they um, they changed their policy to have hospital staff, uh, almost all hospital staff, wear masks, regardless of whether they were having uh, direct contact with, um, with patients, and they noticed a 50% drop in hospital transmission. Uh, I do want to say that wearing a face covering should not replace social distancing and hand washing. You should still keep up with that. Uh, that's very important. Um, we do want restrictions lifted as soon as possible. Um, we want businesses back up and running as soon as we can and for as long as we can. Um, we can't control 
the testing and hospital capacities. But one thing we can do is really try and limit transmission. And this seems like a reasonable step. I do want to note that we have a medical exemption in our order. Uh, there are individuals who, for medical reasons, cannot wear a face covering. They have um, a pre-existing respiratory condition, for example. Um, you can't tell if somebody, you know, what somebody's medical background is just from looking at them. So we urge the public not to attempt to enforce this policy, this order themselves. Don't get into confrontations. If you have a concern or a complaint, please contact our health agent, Laura Vlasic. Um, inclu that includes if you find that businesses aren't posting signage, she can be contacted through the town website or at 7819426653 a um, health agent and our um, health inspector are going to each open the establishment to verify compliance um, but I do want to note also that uh, our health agent has uh, been getting a surge in health complaints um, including those not related to COVID, actually. So she's trying to juggle both the health complaints, which, which we typically like to prioritize, as well as these um, more regular visits to food establishments. I also want to note that uh, many other communities have similar orders in place or in the works, and they may have different or even more severe um, enforcement policies. I know some of them have uh, fines up to $1,000. Um, so communities that do have orders in place at the moment include, but are not limited to North Reading, Wakefield, Peabody, Middleton, Swampscott, Salem, Beverly, Needham, Brookline, Cambridge, and Somerville. So um, if you're going to one of those towns, you may want to um, apprise yourself of their orders anyway. I have two more notes not related to the face coverings. Um, one is that we anticipate and hope that our flu clinics will be popular once again this year. I, it's really important that people get their flu vac vaccine this year. Um, our health agent is already preparing for those flu clinics. We're obviously going to go uh, through, take some steps to make sure they're as safe as possible. Uh, and she has uh, uh, placed her first uh, vaccine order already. Uh, and one other note is that the Board of Health uh, will likely be discussing soon the possibility of allowing food establishments to serve as grocers while dine-in restrictions are in place. This was... Um, an idea brought to us by uh, board member Kevin Sexton. Um, he had seen another community doing this and Laura was in agreement that some establishments might likely be interested in having this, this avenue open. And that is it. Great. Thanks, Emmy. Board members, any questions for Emmy? I mean, I had a couple questions relative to the mask order. Um, just wanted to clarify that children under the age of two should not be wearing masks. Correct. Uh, and I think I had read somewhere that it, uh, it could be enforced by way of a fine pursuant to Board of Health policies. And I wondered what that looks like. Would that be something that would be administered by the health agent and what, uh, what denomination? Yeah, so that would be by the health agent, and um, it's oh, let me look them up. But they're the they're the in the it's in the bylaws, the Board of Health regulations. I think it's fifty dollars for a first violation, a um, hundred dollars for a second, and one hundred and fifty for a third. But I can verify, <laughs> verify that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Carlo. Hi, Emmy. You yeah. um, you included well when the, when it was posted and then amended, and you included the flyer for the language to post uh, in a window on the door. How much time are you giving, or how what kind of bandwidth does the department have to check the apartment buildings, check the numerous businesses we have in town, and never mind the big box. Maybe they've done it already, but I know when this was posted over the weekend and then updated. Uh, I know social media is not the end all be all, but there was a lot of discussion about they seemed to, it came out of nowhere, even though it didn't. But the notice of 
well, this is what we have to do now, and more so for the public entering a business. Um, they might be pumping gas outside and then go into the store and, you know, not have their mask with them. And so I don't know how much time you're giving to the businesses or has it been immediate? Yeah, no, we're, we're allowing some time. We recognize that some businesses didn't get the notice right away. In, in fact, there are some businesses that the, um, the uh, notice actually goes to a corporate office before it goes to the local office. So uh, to the local store. So um, right now the health agent is going around anyone and the inspector, anyone who doesn't have the posted sign is given a sign to post and they're um, given the order and they, uh, you know, explain the order to, to the business owners. So yeah, but we're not, we're, we're not enforcing on the first go around. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Cause I think the general public at large, and I don't know how many are watching tonight and not everyone's on social media, but what other ways of your messaging are you getting out there? Are there direct letters going out? Is it just visits? Is it, what other forms of communication? I know we've got a reverse 911 uh, the other day, uh, which is very helpful. Is there going to be another one in a week? And just some guidance there. So we it gets, you keep on reinforcing it so the public knows. So there was, there was a number of um, avenues of um, uh, getting the information out. In fact, I think actually, I think Jean Delios has a list of all the different ways we, and all the different groups we got the information out to. Um, I don't know if she wants to jump in, but, <laughs> but um, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so the list that I've been keeping is uh, sort of, community updates as well as targeted updates. So the first one was um, when the Board of Health announced uh, last Wednesday at the select board meeting about the facial covering policy. Um, then that followed by um, a blast that went out to the members of the Reading North Reading Chamber. That was an email uh, that was sent on the following day, which was April 23rd. Um, on Monday, April 27th, there was an email blast to all of the um, establishments with a food permit, and that was sent by the health agent. Um, and as was noted, uh, the, uh, the inspection team is continuing to do their work um, in the food establishments, um, and that will include the facial covering policy. Um, then uh, the next day on April 28th, um, I sent out a email to every construction, permitted construction site about the facial covering policy. Um, likewise, uh, an email went out from my end to uh, multifamily residences about the facial covering policy, and that was again on April 28th. And that includes apartments, condominiums, senior housing, and subsidized housing. Um, then Reading Patch had a uh, coverage on April 28th and um, FIRE is working very closely with us um, on some uh, larger construction sites. They're doing um, site visits and inspection checks uh, for COVID-19 compliance. So we feel that that is uh, another uh, uh, very important component. And it's uh, important that we're all collaboratively getting together to work the, the details of this and, and fire has been enormously helpful. So thank you. Go ahead, Carl. Well, me again. Um, I know a few weeks ago we spoke with, I don't know if it was you, Emmy, or Kevin, or who it was about preempt, preemptive work to businesses that are closed. So to not delay them to get open. Has any of that been done yet? So anyone who wants to open, I'll give you an example, is Biltmore, Maine, which has been closed for several weeks. And they say, okay, we want to reopen when the when the state, you know, when uh, Governor Baker says it's okay to open. Uh, is, is the Board of Health have the bandwidth to, or the, the salons, or anyone that needs to be inspected? Because we did speak about this a few weeks ago to kind of get ahead of it. So we don't delay any business owner that wants to open. So. Has anything been done or discussed about that? Um, 
So, uh, Jean actually <laughs> probably has good information for this as well. But yes, there is a plan, a, a plan in place to prioritize businesses. So um, they've broken the business up, businesses up into a list of those that are currently open and those that are currently closed. And the ones that are currently open are going to get routine inspections now so that um, efforts can be focused on the closed businesses when it comes time to, when we know that they can open, right? So, so we can get out straight out to those businesses and the open businesses can take a, a backseat because they'll have already been inspected. Is that fair enough to say, Jean? <laughs> okay. um, I spent a fair amount of time with the health agent and with Deputy Chief Jackson on Monday, uh, just again, going over this through command so that we all had the same uh, understanding. And um, we are focusing on the, what we're calling COVID checks as the top priority. And so all the work that's being done collaboratively with fire um, and health is um, making sure that safety and compliance with COVID-19 uh, protocols is, is number one. And, and the establishments are being visited routinely five and six a day to make sure that's in place and being observed. Um, and now with the face, facial covering policy, that, that will be part of that. Um, second priority is um, deal, getting our, our plan in place for uh, businesses that are sort of in a pending mode to get reopened. And whatever we can do to um, do some preliminary work with them now or just be queued up and ready to go when we get the green light that they can open. Um, we're, we're working through that. And then the third priority is, again, to circle back to the establishments that are open because um, they're open and they're operating and um, seemingly uh, we haven't had any complaints. So uh, we feel pretty confident that they're working well um, and we'll get to them uh, in, that, in that order. Um, but we do feel um, confident that we have a plan and we have the capacity. And now with some additional time extended, um, unfortunately, it's not great for everyone. But um, from a planning point of view, it gives us that much more time to uh, execute. Okay, thank you. And if I could just add, without stealing from Chief Burns' thunder coming up, um, there are a lot of priorities that the command team is dealing with, and, and this is actually one of them. So it, it, it's very much on the radar. Other questions from the board? Karen. Good question. I know um, Bob mentioned last week there were some masks on order. Um, I was wondering if they have come in at this point or still waiting? Uh, some have come in, Bob. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I, I don't uh, have a lot of details on uh, the mask. This is on the agenda for a couple of topics later. Greg will give a full update. Thanks. Other questions from the board? No, all right. Um, so let's kind of continue um, through command. Um, Bob, you'd suggested maybe John would be next. Is that still the plan? Great, so uh, Dr. Doherty, give it to you, please. Great, thank you. And um, Mrs. Dowd is going to contribute to this part of the report also. Um, so first of all, I I want to echo uh, what several of others have said about uh, public safety and, and all the work that they're doing in our nurses. Um, I also want to give a shout out to some other unsung heroes that have been in our um, been coming to work pretty much every day and and either working collaboratively with the town uh, or have been on um, school sites um, doing all kinds of different types of work to keep to keep our um, our buildings moving forward and our in our student needs moving forward so that includes our facility staff our custodians um, food service technicians um, and our nurses who have been working closely with uh, with the public health department. So I want to thank them as well. I also want to thank our teachers and our administrators for the incredible amount of work that they have been doing um, in this challenging time uh, with remote learning. And um, tomorrow night 
at our school committee meeting, I'll be going into a lot more detail about the types of activities that that, have, that are going on right now in our schools. Essentially, in the six weeks that we have been out, and it, it seems more than six weeks, but it has been six weeks, we've really been through three phases. Um, in phase one, we prioritize student and staff safety, um, nutrition, and other foundational needs. That really was the first week to 10 days. Then, as we received more guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, we went into phase two, which is where we were establishing our all of our remote learning uh, platform um, and started developing activities and uh, having our teachers connect with students online. Um, and now we're entering phase three um, with knowing that school is gonna be closed for the rest of the year. Uh, phase three, um, and again, using guidance from the state, um, it's how do we continue that learning? How do we deepen that learning? Um, and how do we build that platform so there's more what's called um, live learning going on um, with the or synchronous learning going on uh, between teachers and students. So that's what we're in the process of doing right now. We're working very closely with the teachers and administrators to make that happen. Um, we are now focused on a lot of other things. Mrs. Dow will go into some detail on some of those, but certainly what's in everyone's mind is graduation. What's that gonna look like? I know Mrs. Boynton, our high school principal is working closely with her counterparts in the Middlesex League um, to try to put together the best possible graduation <clears throat> and graduation activities for our class of 2020. Um, we're also taking a look at what is summer programming gonna look like particularly our students with disabilities. Um, and what is school gonna look like in next September? Um, these are all certainly questions that we have, but these are things that we have been planning, begun the planning process for. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to Mrs. Dowd and she's gonna go. Interrupt just for a moment. Um, I understand that there may be an issue on, on um, the live feed and RCTV at the moment, it's still, up and live on YouTube, and uh, Phil Rushworth is working on it on RCTV right now. Excuse me for interrupting. No problem. Um, thank you. I'm just going to give a very quick update, and I do apologize because I think Chief Burns is probably going to go into slightly more detail on some of it, but the schools have been working very closely with the command group as well as the Board of Health to make sure that we're following all of their guidelines and updates very closely. We have taken it, um, the notices that did come out, we actually did post all of the face covering um, notices, facial covering in all of our schools, mainly because we do still with our lunch distribution and technology distribution, we do have people still entering the building. So we wanted to make sure that we're following all of the safety precautions. So we have posted all of that. Um, we're also working very closely with them. As folks know, school ended rather abruptly on March 13th when we received the notice that got extended, then it got extended, then finally got extended through the end of the year. So unfortunately with that, um, we did not have a chance to fully close out the way we normally would. So we are working closely with um, command and planning to make sure we have a process in place. We have to bring food services folks back in to properly close out the kitchens to make sure everything is closed out correctly, food is disposed of properly to the extent it needs to be, as well as to make sure all of the equipment and the freezers and everything are properly shut down. We also are going to be working, which we'll be giving updates tomorrow, so it's a little bit precursor for school committee. We also were not able to properly have all of the teachers close out their rooms. As most of you know, there is a process where they need to come in, pack up, um, teachers move classrooms year to year. We also, students were not able to completely close out lockers and their desks. So we're working very closely to come up with a plan to allow that to happen in the safest possible way. So um, 
we're working on drafts of that now that we'll be sharing with with the command group and board of health to make sure everyone's in agreement we're also similar to what the town is doing coming up with plans to have staff come back into the buildings once um the restrictions are lifted so that we have a good process to allow that to happen in an organized manner our food distributions are continuing as we had anticipated we have started to see increases in the number of families we are supporting we continue to work very closely um, with kevin bow miller and his team they've been great to work with our food services director danielle collins has been fantastic she is in touch with the state on a daily basis making sure we're able to get our commodity deliveries we're also looking at what we need to do knowing the school year is ending to make sure that we have a plan in place between ourselves and the town to continue to support the families and we're also looking into what potentially this looks like in the fall if schools do not open on time so we're working very closely to make sure um, the families maintain support that we've been able to give them and those are pretty much the most significant technology we're still distributing but i think we've addressed the majority of that right now it's really making sure the grab and go meals are continuing to happen we did make sure the food services group has all of the notifications that came out there also as part of the meals that we're preparing we did put the face covering notice in all the packages we distributed this week to make sure that the families were aware of all the precautions we were taking and that we were following the town guidelines as well. Great. Thanks, Gail. Uh, two quick comments, if I could. One, RCTV is back. Um, and uh, second is, Emmy, there's a, a question um, directed to you, if I could read that one, please. This is from <laughs> Krista Rubin on Fairchild Drive. Thank you to each member of the Board of Health for all of the phenomenal work you have undertaken to keep us all safe. Would you consider placing signage with pictures or pictographs at various locations showing the proper way to wear a mask, cover mouth and nose? I see many people wearing them incorrectly, compromising the protection. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, that's a fair point. I know that um, when the health agent has been going out, she's been uh, directing the businesses the, to um, the proper use of the masks. Um, I think uh, our vice chair, Eleanor Shankoff, is working on some educational information. So this would be right in line with that. So yes, great suggestion. Um, next on the list, I think uh, to, um, to Bob for town department updates. Uh, thank you, Mark. If you don't mind pulling up uh, the two slides I showed you, I sent you rather earlier. Yep, sorry, <laughs> give me one second to... That's, I'll, I'll talk. I'll kill time. Um, much as the schools were planning for a safe reopening, as it were, it's now been extended by the governor to at least May 18th. Um, until such time as when that uh, executive order is lifted, we're following Board of Health guidance for social distancing. Uh, employees are, are coming to work, but working at safe distances from each other. Um, different policies and procedures have changed. For instance, police now have a rotation of vehicles so that if anyone was to become sick, it's easy to trace back. Uh, DPW is one person per maximum in the vehicle. Yeah. And our town departments uh, last week sat down and spent a lot of time, uh, again, doing a phased reopening. And here's some work that the facilities department has done at the town clerk's window, for instance. You can see a shield. It's got space at the bottom so that people can exchange documents back and forth. And it's much like you've seen at many uh, other businesses to protect both the customer and the employee from um, exchanging virus germs. So all of our customer service windows, this is one downstairs in DPW engineering, the blue tape's not off yet. Uh, but, but a key feature is there's still an, abil an ability to share a plan or a large document by sliding it underneath. Um, so that this, the full service should still be in place, but this is just additional safety measures. And I have to give our facilities department a lot of credit. Uh, they went out and purchased some material and they're doing all this work themselves at a time when other towns are just realizing they might have to think about it and that prices are getting expensive. So we're prepared to, to have a reopening. Um, we understand the idea of a phased reopening. 
Um, it really depends on the state and, and what their um, what their time frame is. We really don't know. Um, we do know that on May 18th, it will not be a full return to full opening uh, for anyone. So we're expecting this to go on for some time. Um, there are a few services that were discontinued or changed that are uh, forecast to go back into place. Uh, the simplest example is the town clerk um, stop taking marriage intentions until they're by appointment only, as opposed to just walking in and expressing an interest. Mm -hmm. So again, um, the town departments, you know, will be ready to phase open as needed. Uh, it goes without saying public safety is already working over 100%. They won't be phasing anything opening. Uh, but that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, next, I think Greg, uh, update status of running facilities with high elderly population. Um, so thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. So what we've been doing is two to three times a week, we've been going around and visiting uh, the uh, facilities with high elderly population for a couple of reasons. One, we want to see how they're doing. Uh, we want to see how their residents are doing. And we also want to see if they have enough uh, uh, protective equipment. Uh, very early on when, um, when this first uh, broke in uh, mid-March, uh, there was a real scarcity of uh, particularly masks and um, some of our facilities didn't have enough masks. So we were able to, um, through MEMA, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, get them masks and, and uh, distributed them to them. Also gowns and um, other protective, uh, protective equipment. The um, elderly, elderly facilities are doing well. The staff is doing very well. Um, we're, we're, we're pleased by how they're uh, responding to it. Some of the facilities, you know, have, have their hands full managing it, uh, but they're doing, doing very well. Um, so, you know, the, these facilities are at the, at the highest risk. That, that's where most of the sickness is and unfortunately uh, most of the deaths. So it's something that we're concerned about and, and we're going to continue to follow uh, until this is over. Great. Thanks, Greg. Do board members, if you have questions uh, at any point, please go ahead. Karen, I, I, looks like you have a question. Oh, no. oh sorry. Sorry. I, I anticipate too early. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Mark, one thing to add, um, of the, uh, we've given out to, to these uh, facilities over 700, over 700 pieces of protective equipment to, to the elderly mm -hmm. facilities in town. In addition to the, that doesn't count what we've given to the police, DPW, and, and other facilities. Great, thanks. Uh, Bob, before you and John talk a little bit about summer, do you want me to, to share the uh, the slide of, of goals and activities? Is now a good time for that? Sure, good, great idea. Okay, give me just one second to maneuver it onto the screen. There you go. So, I, I, Greg, I want to let you uh, talk about all the things that you have been engaged with in, in leading the community response here. Well, first, that's not me. <laughs> this is something that, that, um, that we've all been working on. Every town department, school department has been instrumental with this. Um, John, um, John Doherty, Gail, Gail, Gail Goud, uh, the, the police department, uh, uh, public services, uh, the DPW. All the town departments have worked towards this. This is something I just kind of threw together this afternoon. You know, we've been right in the middle of this for, for several weeks right now. And um, in, because we're in, in the moment, we're trying to, to um, prepare for what we think is coming, but we're not sure. And as things change, I just want to take a, a minute and, and jot down the accomplishments that were accomplished together with all the departments working uh, hand in hand. And I think I probably missed about 30, 40% of them. And I know if the schools added all of their stuff on this, this, this would keep going and going and going. But it, it gives you a little bit of a insight to what we've been working on to make sure the residents are safe, the employees are safe, that uh, businesses, once there, we get approval from the governor's office and the uh, Board of Public Health, 
can open and open safely and also so the residents can uh, recover. Um, so that's what this is all geared to. I don't know if you wanted me to read all of this. It's a, it's a lot, but there's, there's been a tremendous amount accomplished um, in the last several weeks. And if you're not part of it, you may not know that these things were in place and, and happening. I think it, it's great. I think uh, more important is to kind of see the the size of this and the fact that, as you mentioned, that there may be another thirty or forty percent that aren't even here. It's a but, quite a list of accomplishments. Oh, there, def there definitely is things that are missing. Is after um, after I sent it to the town manager, I thought of three or four other things to add to it. <laughs> so, and it's it's all about preparing the residents, making sure they're safe, making sure the employees are safe, and making sure that. Uh, we're, we're ready to open up when, when that happens because we don't want an order to open and then to delay uh, a business from opening because uh, we can't we can't get that inspection done. Exactly. Great. Uh, John and Bob, school and summer recreation programs. Sure, I'll start. Um, I also just want to make a quick comment on Greg's list that um, usually in emergency management, we have an, an incident of far less duration. So there's a time to uh, reflect on the incident, usually within a few days after it ends. Um, the governor put it well at a press conference today when someone asked him if he has any uh, time to, re to relax or wind down. He said, absolutely not. This is a 24-hour job for the foreseeable future. And the same is true here, but it's really important that we reflect on things we've done, things we've done well, things that we could improve on, and not just hurdle head first uh, into the future. So it's really helpful when Greg sits down and puts a list together. Um, we talked about having a reopening plan probably faster than others started to think about it. Um, the, the planning component of this is really important. And we also need to learn um, kind of from what we're doing. The, the uh, summer issue is something that um, I've, I've asked our, our state delegation, who's done a great job on almost everything else, to try to get us some state guidance on the summer. Um, I think it would be difficult for individual communities to take actions, although some are starting to. Um, I learned two days ago that the state is unlikely, uh, not impossible, but unlikely to say anything until that May 18th deadline on whether to hold summer programs or whether to cancel summer programs or what circumstances they could be held under. Um, there was a very large uh, rec director, rec uh, uh, phone call today across the state. Um, everyone's wrestling with the same kind of issue, trying to imagine how to open and run safe programs. And quite honestly, from my perspective, I just don't see how it's possible for most programs. The advantage is you're outside, that's a tremendous advantage. The disadvantage is it's a lot of people usually packed in in a lot of space. Um, there's not a lot of summer activities that have six foot distances between people. So um, Reading will remain as flexible as we can. Uh, we'll try to balance the need for residents to have a decision from us. Um, but most importantly, it's, it's the safety of the, especially the kids that are forefront. And um, we'll see if we can wait till May 18th to make a decision. We'll do our best to do that. Um, hopefully the state uh, you know, can speed it up a little or perhaps give us some guidance on what type of activities would be okay. Um, but again, I have to say from my perspective, if I had to decide today, I would, I would say we're closed for the summer. And then uh, perhaps some activities could be opened if they could be done safely. Um, I know John and I have spent some time talking about this and talking about the fall semester for schools. Um, our facilities department has set up mock classrooms with so social distancing. And uh, it's not a pretty sight. Um, I don't know, you get maybe six or eight kids in a classroom. And I know there's been discussion about uh, you know, going to staggered shifts for students and for teachers and for classes. So you know, we want to over-prepare and over-plan for this, I guess, because we just don't know what future directions are. Um, and certainly the town and the schools would like to make uh, the same decision in terms of summer activities. Uh, so at this point, John, if you want to uh, jump in. Sure. Um, I a, little, a lot what Bob said. I echo. Obviously, in the decisions that we're making this summer, it's it's really going to be based on uh, student and staff safety. Um, what is the an increasing challenge for us though is that we will have to provide some sort of 
programming for our students with disabilities. So we're currently planning right now two different paths. One path is if we are gonna have extended year programming for students with disabilities uh, on site in a, at a school. The other option is to provide a remote learning environment, which is obviously a lot more challenging uh, for, for students with, with disabilities. So um, those, those are the two avenues that we're looking at right now. Um, in addition to that, obviously there's the, the schools, there's always a lot going on in the schools, but um, you know, our extended year program, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, our um, yeah, extended year program with um, after school programming with students that we have during the summer and our summer school program is also something that we need to look at. But, you know, uh, we're going to also work very closely with the town and make similar decisions um, that would be made with recreation. Um, but the, the big one right now is how do we how do we deliver the services in our extended years uh, services for those students with disabilities. Sure. Karen, you had a question. Um, I, I, my heart goes out to all the families and children um, affected by this, and I understand the, the complexities affecting their families. Um, just to, uh, before we get off this topic, I just wanted to follow up as this is an ongoing um, situation. Are we getting the mass in that we ordered? Um, and, and probably this is for Greg. If you hang on about 30 seconds, Karen, that's the next item literally on the agenda. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions so far? Keep rolling. Okay, Greg, please, could you address that question? <laughs> sure. sure. So uh, we have gotten uh, part of the shipments that have been ordered. Uh, we're still waiting. And um, up until uh, just a couple of days ago, we weren't sure we we're, were waiting for a somewhat larger shipment. We weren't quite sure if we were going to get them or not, but but we did. And and so what what we've what we've been doing uh, today is is putting a, a plan in place to distribute masks to residents. Um, we couldn't do it last week because we we didn't have them and didn't know when they were going to come in. And we have to make sure that we we're protecting our employees because we have people that are responding to calls where, where people are infected. So we have to make sure that we have enough um, for, for all our people that have to work out in, in the street. So um, we did develop a, a plan uh, with the assistance um, of, the, of the police department and the school department um, and um, public services and library staff we have a plan to distribute masks to the residents and uh, tentatively it, it's for um, Wednesday, uh, May 6th at, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So we've carved out um, several thousand masks uh, to, to give away to, to the residents. And we, because there is such short supply, we wanna make sure that they go to the residents of the most vulnerable. So we're looking at distributing them to residents who are 60 and older, and, and for those who may have medical issues. Um, so that's, that's, our, that's our target. Uh, we, we're gonna have um, about 8,000 masks to distribute. We'll, we'll save us a, um, a supply for our elderly um, uh, facilities in the, in the community, and we'll distribute those ourselves to them for, for those people that can't get out. The, the process will be, um, they'll drive into the field house um, and remain in their cars and we'll distribute that, uh, those masks to them. Uh, so it's, it's, we're, we're pretty far along on it. And um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that um, the event will be successful. We're also incorporating um, volunteers. We've had a lot of people that, uh, volunteered to assist us um, in responding to the COVID-19 crisis. So we're gonna use some volunteers in this effort as well. That's great. Can I just jump in? Can I just jump in real quick? Yes, please. Um, um, I just wanted to jump in real quick and just say a, a shout out to our health agent, Laura Vlasic, because it's hard to get masks. And and she had a contact who who did end up coming through. So so shout out to her. Thank you. 
That, that, that's right. Yes. And that, that was instrumental because that was a, that was a big shipment for us, you know, several thousand. And without that, this just wouldn't have happened. So thank you, Emmy. Yes. Fabulous. Uh, next is discussion of community events. Um, Greg, do you want to update that one as well, please? Uh, I thought uh, Bob was going to update it. Um, Bob has better information on the Memorial Day observances and um, Friends and Family Day. All right, I can do that. Um, also, on the uh, mass distribution, um, there will be a code red announcement going out either Thursday or Friday, and then another one on Monday as a reminder. Um, there will also be plenty of literature uh, available to publicize the event. And there will be some sort of a leaf litter flyer handed out to people as they, um, as they arrive. Uh, just again, pointing at resources and other things that they may want to know. And just to emphasize Greg's point, um, this is meant to be uh, a directed effort at the most needy people in town, the demographically neediest. Um, our volunteers have um, created a lot of homegrown, home knitted masks that have met the demand Every single person that has asked the town for a mask as of this morning has one or has had the need met. Um, but this effort will go well above and beyond the people that have asked. We know there's people that aren't asking us, um, but it's important that only people that really need these masks um, show up because we just don't want to run out. We don't know when we can have a second event because the supply chain is so er erratic right now. Um, in terms of community events, the uh, Friends and Family Day in June is officially canceled. Uh, Memorial Day services will not take place in cemeteries. There's still a plan ongoing to have a very, very small gathering. And by that, I mean maybe four or five of us uh, out in the common or perhaps right in front of town hall. Um, and to have um, an, an honor of the day, an honor of the veterans in that way. It's a very different year this year. Um, our veterans agent, Kevin Bow Miller, is certainly is something near and dear to his hearts. And as he said to you last week, the veterans will not be forgotten. Uh, it will be different this year. Um, we ha this is an issue, again, we really haven't had any uh, advice from the state other than you know, by extending to May 18th, the date of, uh, you know, it's likely to still be a 10 person or less gathering. So gathering in the cemeteries is really just out of the question at this point. I've been in touch with two folks um, related to the Fall Street Fair. No decision has been made on that yet. That's an early September event. Uh, my guess is they will have to decide in the next 30 or 45 days because as many of you know, there's a lot of advanced planning there. I have no real sense of where that will go. Uh, and those are the three big sort of community events uh, on the horizon. Uh, if any of you can think of other gatherings uh, that would be large, um, you know, please let us know and we'll, we'll work on those. You know, graduation clearly would be one and, and John is working on that. Thanks. Um, just a quick comment for, uh, for Greg and for Emmy. Um, the point that was made earlier by Krista Rubin about literature and how to properly uh, wear and use a mask, might it be possible to distribute that with the masks? Uh, yes, we're working on that now. And um, so, Mass care is, is part of it, um, you know, when it needs to be thrown out, things like that. And um, we, I, I hope to include the other aspect and wearing it properly as well. So we're, we're in the process of including that. Great. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is uh, financial health. Um, Bob and John, uh, have you listed here? And you saw from our legislators that that's what the, that's the issue they spent the most time on. <laughs> It's not something we've talked about a lot in Reading, um, but it's certainly something that we've worked a lot on. Uh, May 12th, there will be a finance committee meeting uh, to discuss uh, altering the FY21 budget. Um, John and Gail and I, as, as well as Sharon and Andre at Town Hall, have looked at revenues, looked at expenses. Um, it's really too soon to publicly say much, but I, I will say the magnitude of the cut is not nearly what you've seen in other city or other states. Um, prop two and a half giveth and taketh away. Prop two and a half never let us spend much money. So now, having a two two and a half percent, uh, you know, guaranteed stream of income, albeit perhaps uh, cash flow uh, uncertainty. Um, is a tremendous benefit for towns in Massachusetts. 
uh, we will not be looking at 15% reductions of our revenues like the state is looking at because so much of our revenues in Reading are property taxes. Again, people may pay slowly uh, and we'll have to ac accommodate for the cash flow, uh, but budget cuts um, will not be as severe as you'll read in the papers from other, other states and other cities and towns across the country frankly, because they've had 7 and 10% uh, increases annually for many years, and we never did that. So um, the good news is the cuts will be relatively low. Uh, the bad news is that this will, uh, on, in aggregate, undo a big percent of what the override was. Not to say we're going to cut all those services by any means. I think the biggest challenge for John and I uh, as was referenced, I think, by Representative Jones, is for how long? What does this look like? Um, it's, it's a relatively straightforward exercise to cut a budget for next year. What about the year after? What about the year after that? What are the assumptions? What is state aid going to look like in years two and three? Those are very hard questions right now. Um, if we knew for sure what the next three to five years had in store, I think John and I would have a much clearer picture about what we should do. But since we don't, or at least I'll speak for myself, I don't want to disassemble the organization and then find out in a year or two, gee, things got better pretty fast. We didn't really have to do that. Reading, again, is in an ex extremely fortunate position uh, in having a very large balance of reserves. Um, we could have town meeting pass the exact same budget that's in front of it and have no worries at all from a financial standpoint. It just seems very imprudent to do that and very honestly, very disrespectful. Um, so we will be making uh, cuts. Uh, you know, there'll be a, both the school and the town. We'll be asking FinCom to use a little bit more reserves. Uh, we'll try to do some things, which is a little harder for John, that can be restored during the year if things get better. So capital comes right to mind. If uh, all of a sudden in uh, next October, November, our uh, picture is better, it's easy to spend capital at a November town meeting or even at an April town meeting. Uh, for the schools especially, it's impossible to hire teachers in the middle of a year. Uh, you just don't do that. So I think we're, um, we've given it a lot of thought. Uh, I think we, uh, much, much as the representatives and senators said, we're being extremely conservative and probably assuming hopefully worse than what happens. Um, when they asked me what, um, you know, what they should bring into their discussions, I said the same thing to them, which is don't assume anything that's positive. Assume the worst. Assume about as bad as you can imagine because what would not help the schools in the town, especially, is mid-year cuts when they, when they don't guess right next year and they don't have a rainy day fund that's big enough. Um, we have seen that twice in my tenure where there's been mid-year 9C cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if it happens halfway through the year, you have to cut twice as much halfway through the year to, to take, you know, take care of that revenue shortfall. So I've also urged them, um, you know, please give it to us straight. Uh, don't sugarcoat it. Um, so again, we are expecting um, a large decrease in local revenues, but not nearly on the order of what the state, you know, will see as a percent. And again, we do have a good rainy day fund ourselves. Um, you know, the, the careful budgeting and careful spending we've all done for the last few years, notwithstanding an override, has really now would put us in a better position than many. John? The, uh, the only other piece I want to add is I think this is where the open communication that we have between town and schools is even more important. Um, We've already had, uh, Bob and I and Gail have been talking about this probably for two to three weeks now of what this would, you know, what could this look like? Um, so we, you know, we've been planning this. Um, we have a few additional challenges um, outside of the, the revenue piece. Obviously, there's going to be some costs associated with um, the remote learning moving forward if that continues. Um, there may be some additional special education costs. Um, so those are the types of things that we have to take a look at now. It's almost like there are certain aspects of our budget that we need to rethink um, along with the, the revenue piece that Bob mentioned. Um, yesterday, I, I circulated um, town budget 
draft cuts to department heads. Um, and, and they're not all cuts. Some are additions, some are changes. We clearly have some COVID-19 related expenses that we know are there and it would be dishonest or disingenuous to ignore them. Um, but order of magnitude, um, we have already spent or committed about $200,000 just for COVID on the town side. Uh, and I know the schools have a figure and that's expenses, that's not wages. Um, I'm sure we will not fully budget the costs of COVID-19, no matter what we do, because we just can't know. So again, our cash reserves will come in quite handy next year if, if we have you know, any large number. Um, I know the schools, um, you know, depending on what course of action they take for the next year, uh, as John mentioned, there's gonna be some, some new and possibly very large costs related to COVID-19 that we just can't know today and, and may not know until August. So it, it will be a different budget. We're hoping very much that uh, it can be presented succinctly to FinCom on May 12th, and uh, hopefully they'll agree with the approach. And then, um, you know, hopefully again on June 15th, we can just dispense of the budget and a couple of other small housekeeping issues related to that um, with a one day town meeting. Um, I've been in touch with our other area managers and, and our delegation and a one twelfth budget in July is absolutely a last resort. Uh, it is not something that anyone wants to do. It's, it's something that has to be a real emergency that you just couldn't have foreseen. And right now, we have a lot of advanced time to plan. So I, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to meet in some fashion, remotely or otherwise, in June, have a town meeting and have a budget passed. And um, it's, you know, we're, we're doing it at a time, uh, all, all levels of government are serving the constituents and suffering losses. It's not quite the same as many businesses that are suffering significant losses, but they're, they're at home not doing much. They don't have a business to run. You know, the travel business doesn't exist. Very difficult if you work in that field, but at least you're not also being asked to be at work and provide 110% of the service that you were previously doing. So that's the fine line that John and I want to walk is the service that we're providing is going to be assumed and needed. And again, we don't want to disassemble the organizations that provide that service. Thanks, Bob. Um, on that point, May 12th FinCom meeting, um, I'm wondering how many select board members might want to participate in that meeting. I for one do. Um, if three of us are, three or more of us are interested, let's post. I see yeah. enough heads nodding. Let's post, please, for, uh, for the select board for the May 12th FinCom meeting. Thank okay. you, folks. I'm sorry, did I interrupt, Bob? No, all set, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so next on the agenda, um, I think we will um, put in some public public comment. What I wanted to do... Mark, I have a couple questions, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ann. Before we move on. Um, I appreciate um, what Dr. Doherty mentioned about the town and schools working collaboratively. And to that end, I would encourage um, you know both Bob and John to to approach this um, looking at, at the needs that exist and and have those drive budgeting decisions versus what the traditional split has been. I know that when um, the override was set um, years uh, a few years back, um, you know there was an adherence to the traditional split, uh, and I and I don't know where exactly the needs will uh, derive from, but I would I would encourage um, us to to move forward in a way that we're addressing the needs that arise uh, versus trying to you know to hold um, the the split that's always roughly been in place. Excellent point, yeah. Um, and I had I don't know where this would be appropriate um, if if now is the time. Um, to to uh, address a, a question that we did discuss somewhat last week with respect to food security. Uh, and Kevin Bolden-Miller spoke uh, about the work that Human and Elder Services was doing um, with respect to helping residents apply for SNAP benefits uh, and the like. And I didn't know if there was any new information from Human and Elder Services uh, on the food security side of things. I did um, 
re receive from Reverend Jamie Michaels um, of Old South United Methodist Church some information and update from the food pantry if you'd like me to share that at any particular time. Please, I think timing is, is good. Should we um, first kind of address your question? That would be great. Uh, I, I don't know who the right person is or if we have the answer tonight, if we should come back. Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking at Jean, but she can't tell because <laughs> I'm looking at everybody. <laughs> um, I can speak to that a little bit. I did speak with Kevin Bow Miller today to um, get an update on where we were at with um, the food that's been collected at the Pleasant Street Center. And I know he spoke about that last week. Um, it really was a, a really um, dramatic statement from the volunteer community. And we're very appreciative of the um, Young Women's League and the uh, Reading Lions for um, gathering all of that food for us. Um, we have um, compiled food bags and distributed a portion of that food but there still is food at the center um, and bags that can be very easily um, sent out. Our van driver is there every day, Monday through Friday. Um, and as needs arrive, uh, as needs arise, uh, the van driver is uh, very uh, happy to go out and deliver the food. So um, that was something that command early on identified um, as being a concern and a concern that we took very seriously so that we were being responsive to that pocket of need in the community. And I think we've done that. Um, in, in addition, the um, donations and the uh, gift cards, we have a systematic way of processing and tracking those. Um, some go directly to the food pantry. Some um, we have uh, a system for um, uh, allocating them. And um, so I think the biggest thing in my mind that we're doing that I think is touching the community and the community of need is uh, the daily phone calls that go out to our um, most fragile population, our most vulnerable. And those are continuing. Um, likewise, although it's not Elder Human Services, we're daily contacting the business community as much as we're concerned about the vulnerable population of need, we're also so concerned about the business community. And um, Aaron Schaefer, our economic development director, and uh, myself and so many others um, are really boots on the ground, uh, reaching into that business community. We're working very collaboratively with, um, with the chamber and other community partners. We're on calls every day with statewide groups um, so that we can be really plugged in. And um, if you haven't had a chance to go to the website and see the letter that gets updated routinely um, on that economic development, I'd encourage you to do that. There's a lot of resources. Just click here. And I think we've talked about it a little bit in the select board meeting. So um, I know that's a little more than what you asked for, but um, I think I think we're on it. And you're... you're uh, there you go. You did, I just realized. Uh, I said that was great. Thank you, Jean. Um, and I know Gail spoke to this to a certain extent, and I've spoken offline with, with Bob about this a little bit, about um, uh, being able to sustain um, the provision of meals to students throughout the summer. And is that something um, from either the town or school side we'd be looking at in terms of um, amending budgets for for FY21. So Bob, if you want, I can jump in, or Mark, sorry. Please, Went yeah. to the wrong person. Um, so, sorry, Mark. Of course. <laughs> um, I looked at Bob, because um, actually Bob and I have had numerous discussions about this, because we do want to make sure, um, from the school side, it is, trying to be a rule follower and it is very heavily regulated we are very fortunate that the food services director that we hired she started um, in the fall actually has gone through all the certification programs necessary to run a summer program which is the first hurdle okay. to overcome so if 
there was the need to do that. We are certified to do that. Um, she's the only person on our staff right now that is so, but it's great because she runs the program for us as well as Wakefield. We also, which has not come out yet, there is, she's been on the phone every day with Desi, with the state, because there are specific waivers that you need to have in order to run what they call a seamless summer program. And what that does is it allows you to not only run the program, which you have to have the waiver for a school to run the program. And the reason is because students are actually not consuming the meals on site. We're actually giving them food to take off premise. So there is guidance that's coming out that we believe will allow us to use our commodity, which is great because it gives us the pricing that has been determined um, through DESI and DOD for that. It would also allow us to obtain reimbursements, which is the key part to make it a sustainable program. So we believe those waivers are forthcoming. So we have been having discussions with command and the town to look at ways to do it. And I, I have to thank Bob because the first thing he said to me is, we need to do what's right. Don't that we have to know what it's going to cost, but don't let that drive the decision. We have to make sure we're doing what's right for the population. Um, but we have received good news that we don't think it would be cost prohibitive to do it. Um, we're also working through the mechanics because one thing that they've said is that this would allow you to continue to run this type of program through the end of September, which we think is tied more to a federal deadline than a state deadline. So we're in the process of looking at what the needs might be, but um, it, it's been a very collaborative process. And I do thank Bob and the rest of the command structure to let us look at what it would take and not let only the cost be the driver of it. Thank you, Gail. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from command that we haven't covered? Mark, would you like me to um, relay what I learned uh, relative to the food pantry? Yes, please. Yeah, please. So, um, I heard from Reverend Michaels that they have seen an increase in new clients, both folks they had not seen before and people who are coming back after an absence. Um, but numbers physically at the pantry haven't been abnormally high. Um, and they think that might be because a fair number of people are sh effectively sheltering in place and aren't going out either to the food pantry, pantry nor the grocery store. Um, and so they're trying to organize a donation program for them. There was another group of individuals uh, of clients who had heard that they had closed for two weeks but hadn't heard that they had reopened. But the food pantry is in fact, reopened. Um, and th their understanding is that um, the greatest need right now is among families. Kids are home, they're eating more, and um, it's families are struggling, a lot of families are struggling to meet that demand. Um, they said that they're, you know, very grateful. There have been lots of financial donations to the pantry. Um, so some, it's, the, the greater struggle sometimes is food availability because stores can be sold out, um, but they're doing the best they can. They're very grateful to, for the support of the community. Um, and that that is the update from the food pantry. Thanks, Anna. Other comments or questions? Great. Sorry. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nathan. Uh, took me a moment to unmute. Um, so uh, my questions are more for Bob, but um, they may be more appropriate for the upcoming FinCom meeting. Um, so I was curious about the anticipated lost revenue, Bob. I know you already touched on that. It, it's, it's a little soon to tell. Um, but in particular, as it relates to the meal tax, um, assuming that, that that's going to be impacted. Um, I'm curious how assessed values um, are going to be impacted, especially commercial properties. Um, and we obviously heard from our state delegation on state funds. Um, we also talked um, a couple weeks ago now about anticipated water and sewer capital projects that are on the horizon and that those may get delayed. Um, so an update on that would also be helpful. So I'm not seeking any answers now, but just things um, that are, I think, um, important to raise as we move forward. Thank you. 
I can answer some of those now. Um, for the meals tax, um, our prior assumption had been over 400,000. That's about cut in half for next year. Uh, that's assuming some kind of a soft staggered opening this summer and not a, certainly not a return to full speed ahead until some part of the year. Um, in terms of property valuations, again, the beauty of Prop 2.5, if you will, is that it's a levy on the tax base as a whole. The shift between commercial and residential may happen if commercial values go down, but it doesn't technically affect the income that the town receives, if you will, if, if people pay on time. So the, the property valuation will have no input in, in impact sorry, on total revenue, perhaps timing of revenue, again, if people pay slowly. And um, there will be some delays in capital projects, um, especially uh, in water and sewer. Um, as I mentioned to you uh, a, a couple weeks ago, um, it was not palatable to have an increase in water and sewer or have the smallest one possible. Um, but, but one of the challenges in, in water and sewer, because it's so much smaller uh, than the general fund, is something that um, the senator mentioned earlier. You have to assume that less people are going to pay on time. In taxes, that's not a big impact. In water or sewer, it could be. Um, we, we assume right now 4% of the people will pay slowly. If we just increase that to 6%, it drives up rates more than you're going to want to increase them. So we're, we're trying to walk a fine line here of, uh, being very sensitive to the ratepayer, but being very realistic as well. So hopefully that answers many of your questions. And I think, Bob, late, later in May, we're scheduled to take a look at water and sewer rates. Is that right? Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, normally, uh, or at least in the last several years, town meeting has appreciated it if the board votes rates before town meeting. So before June 15th is probably uh, the best arrangement. So yeah, after the FinCom meets, certainly, and before town meeting meets is ideal. Great, thanks. Any other quick comments? Okay, let me suggest this. Why don't we take a five minute break? Um, why don't we, oh, it's 8.47, of course. How about we come back at, at uh, 8.55, five minutes to nine, we'll come back. So we'll go to, to recess till 8.55.
I can thump for a second here. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to do two things. One is I'd like to do uh, make a comment about public comment, accept public comment, and then uh, if the board is okay with it, let's change the order slightly. Um, John Stempeck has been waiting uh, very, very patiently. Let's move to the RMLD topics, and then we'll come back to the liaison topics and then finish the agenda. Is that is that okay with everybody? Great. Okay. Um, all right. So let's do this. I, I um, created a slide. Let me just see if I'm able to share it. Okay, so I, I wanted to clarify a little bit further how we administer our public comment policy as we work with emails coming to the board. The board received some comments about how we're doing this over the last few weeks. We discussed our policies at the last meeting, and I've also consult, excuse me, consulted with town council to better understand how I believe we should handle public comments. So our select board written policy allows for public comment when people are recognized by the chair. They may then speak for the prescribed period of time and they should avoid making disparaging comments about individuals. This is the actual policy that's in our, our select board policy handbook. So to best administer this through email participation, I'd, I'd like to set the following guidelines. And this is really a clarification, I think more than anything else. We will accept public comment via email or letter where residents state their name and address. Comments will be published in our meeting packets based on when they are received. If received before the next meeting is posted, it will be included in that week's packet. If it's received after the posting, but before the following meeting is posted, it will be included in the second packet. We will establish a period of public comment toward the beginning of each meeting at the chair's discretion. Residents are invited to send in their comments and they should correspond to a speaking time of up to two minutes and avoid making disparaging comments about individuals. We will read the comments in their entirety unless the comment or some portion of the comment violates the policy or applicable law. In addition, the chair may in his or her discretion allow for public comment during the meeting as we address items on the agenda subject to the guidelines above. Comment is welcome on all matters of concern to citizens. If the matter is in the select board's purview, we may review it for action. If the matter is not in the board's purview, we may refer it to staff or other boards and committees as appropriate. A few other clarifying comments. Comments that are posted with the agenda can be addressed by the select board at that meeting if the requirements of the open meeting law are otherwise satisfied. Other comments may not be addressed by the board. Comments received during the meeting about agenda items can be addressed by board members at the meeting. Comments that are not about agenda items cannot be addressed as they're not part of the agenda. If we receive a large number of comments from people on any one issue, making it infeasible to read each comment without undue repetition, delay, or disruption to the meeting, we may consider summarizing the comments on an issue rather than reading each one and tally the number of people voicing a particular comment. So I, I worked on uh, understanding kind of where we are and getting a, a good understanding from town council. And I'm hoping that this clarifies things. Um, and where it doesn't, I would ask that people um, share their comments and, and, and opinions toward that end so that we can improve it. Um, I do have one comment. Uh, that came in earlier this evening. I'd like to read that one now, if that's all right. Sorry, I'm just changing my screens here for a moment. Uh, so this is from W. Bruce Cooper, 20 Covey Hill Road, Reading. Uh, the subject is suggestions for public comments during Zoom meetings. Public comment policies for virtual meetings. Virtual meeting policies for public comments should be published on the town website for virtual meetings. Policies should be stated at the start of the meeting. Email and phone mail comments should be permissible if in compliance with policies. A summary of a comment is not acceptable. Email comments should be displayed on screen and in quotes voiced during the meeting. Phone mail comments should be played. Email should be read by the town manager or by designated staff. If reading of emails by the town manager or designated staff is not acceptable to the board, then quote text to voice software should be used to, quote, voice the email comments. 
for phone mail comments, quote, voice to text software should be used to later publish with the emails in the board packet. Clear instructions should be stated on how to access public comments in the board packets. Uh, I was gonna say, why don't we pause for a moment, see if there are any other, I have not seen any other public comments so far this evening. Anybody else seen anything? Okay, why don't we, sorry, let me just shift gears here slightly. Let's go on to the um, RMLD discussions. And Mark, my impression was we, we would be discussing public comment, how other communities handle it and suggestions for um, future meetings at our next meeting. Yeah, thanks, I think that's a good idea. Um, so my, my hope in making that statement was more to clarify uh, I guess existing policy and and uh, and structure. I think that what we really want to do, and we talked about at our last meeting, was to learn more about how it's being done effectively in other places, and if we can make improvements to the system that we're using. So I, I would agree with you. I think we should put that onto our agenda for our next meeting uh, as a as an item to discuss and and, and get some feedback. I know, and, and you you've gotten some feedback. I've received a little bit of feedback. Other members may be getting some feedback as well. And if uh the next that next packet could include these public comment guidelines. I haven't um, myself really fully digested them. Um, I think that would be helpful. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think what we can do, yeah, is publish them into the next packet, and it probably will make sense to publish more formally, um, either as they are or as we adopt uh, going forward. Most of these were taken from kind of our existing policy and. Um, how it has been done. Uh, there were some clarifications that were made, and I know uh, in last week's public comment, there were some questions specific to that. And that's what I tried to address with Ray, is to make sure that we understood what what's required, how it should be done. Carla. Mark, is the, uh, thank you uh, for putting this together. Is the bottom section uh, a work in progress, I guess, for the board to talk about in the future? I think it definitely can be um, the points one and two in terms of the the posting um, is, is how it's handled is how we've handled it I guess as a board and I believe how it's supposed to be um, the third item in terms of large numbers um, is something that we we did talk about last week and we certainly can talk about going forward um, the question that came up was how to handle a lot of comment without being disruptive to the meeting the point of public comment is to allow people to, to be able to have their say um, as part of the meeting. And um, so the question that I raised was, how can one handle lots and lots and lots of comments? And this was the feedback. I, can I uh, say one? I know we talked about this last week, as Ann said, but can I, I want to bring something to the board's attention that Bob uh, may or may not mention uh, before tonight's end is uh, I spoke with a colleague in Wakefield Oh, who's the chair, uh, Ed Dombrowski, and they are doing a little summit uh, next week with all the neighboring towns. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Mark, yet, but uh, it's next Tuesday night. Yep, 7 p.m. In fact, I was going to put that on the on our agenda. Um, initially, it was going to be a closed group, and then they decided to uh, make it a broader group. And what I wanted to offer to the board is the opportunity for any and all to participate. Uh, we just need to know if, if we'll have quorum, and if so, then uh, essentially to post. Okay, yeah, I, I I was under the impression when I spoke to Ed today that it, he, he was going to ask uh, the town manager and a few of the board members, but obviously if all the board members wanted to attend, uh, I don't see any problem with that, but it's going to be uh, informative, best practices, and how to handle public comment, and a number of other topics. So I think that would be very useful um, to see what other towns are doing as instructed by you last week or that we all discussed and to, you know, see some of the faces that are doing, going through the same thing. Well, yeah. I, I thought it was about um, more about the sort of reopen plans for reopening. I didn't realize it was broader than that. Yeah, that was my understanding also. It was about kind of restart. Uh, and Bob, you may have the best insight here. Uh, no, I have the same insight you and Ann do. That's, uh, Carlos, that's all news to me if that's going to happen. Um, I do expect to get an agenda sometime tomorrow from Wakefield 
Um, they know that we have to post you uh, tomorrow if there's going to be a quorum, and I'm going to assume there will be. So uh, as soon as I have an agenda, I'll certainly forward it to the board. But I, I was also under the impression it was really just to have a coordinated uh, discussion about a reopening, if you will. That could have changed. Okay, I, I heard differently, but whatever is whatever is going to be discussed will be discussed. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking to town council, um, I did go out and take a look at um, Winchester and Linfield, and although in the case of Linfield, I am seeing public comment posted on their agenda and, and sitting through their audio only meeting, there was no public comment and there was no public comment in a Linfield meeting. Did you have any discussions with town council as to how bad is that? Are, are they I'm like, are they just doing it because it's a pandemic? I, I, this is, it was eye opening to me that is there those two towns specifically were so different than what we've been doing i can answer the linfield part um, linfield has not had public comment in over 20 years and there's only one resident that has complained very different town <laughs> right i suggest that um i think this is worthy of uh, more discussion and and we should put it on to uh our agenda for for the next meeting to kind of continue our discussions of, of how, how do we improve it how do we how do we make it um as useful to the citizens as possible and also allowing us to conduct our business thank you okay okay let's shift over to uh two topics related to uh the reading municipal light department um the first one relating to the payment to the town discussions that have been taking place the second one related to the 20-year uh, agreement. Um, Vanessa or Karen, do you want to introduce it or, or uh, just, just we want to have Johnny, you, um, would you like to, to make a, a statement or how would you like to proceed? Sure, I'd be happy to unless uh, Vanessa or Karen, uh, who've been attending our meetings <laughs> religiously and we thank you very much for that. Um, but uh, yes, I could, I'd certainly be, I'd like to be able to talk to it if I could. Uh, and then uh, take any comments uh, off of that. First, um, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting us to the meeting and it's been very enlightening and um, we will definitely start doing this more often. I think it uh, really enhances the communication between us and between the town um, and between our, the, quite frankly, the four towns that we serve uh, as well. Um, and as you know, the RMLD is doing what they do best, which is um, make, making sure that you, you get the power that you need and keeping the power on during this coronavirus and uh, our general manager is amongst other things has created multiple teams uh, so that one team is isolated from another uh, in case there are issues that come up and there's many other things that, that she has done and I think uh, has been very much in front of the, the entire virus. Um, the only good news uh, if there is any that comes out of this is that the RMLD still has about has rates that are approximately one half of uh, national grid or effort source. So for those individuals who are losing or have lost their jobs, it makes it much easier at least to face that as opposed to getting double that you know, at some point in the future. So uh, let me spend just a little bit of time talking about why we're wrestling with this, uh, because I think it's very important. I don't know how many of you know the background. Obviously, Karen does and Vanessa does and, and Mark, certainly you, <laughs> having been to our meetings uh, as, as well. Um, we have two payments basically that we make to the town. One is what's called above the line payment, which is, uh, it's, it's formulatic. It's 2% of the net plan of the RMLD times the percentage of usage across our four town system. And that's you know, cut and dried. We have, we know those numbers. They're in the packet that has sort of been sent out and or posted and has been very straightforward. The other payment to the town is what's called below the line. And this is, terminology certainly I didn't invent, it's been around for a long time, but the below the line payment is uh, first and foremost, it's a voluntary payment, but you know, we've been doing it for decades. We know the town depends on it. It's something that can't go away. Um, and it's basically, if you want to think about it, it's a, it's a payment for the fact that the town put the initial assets of the RMLD into this pot that serves four towns which then became state law mandated essentially. And so at that point in time, there was a, a, a difference between the RMLD being tied at the hip to the town of Reading and now serving four towns. And so we had to find some way of um, 
compensating Reading for doing that. So you might think of it as an annuity. So the assets were put into a place and you get a certain percentage back every year from those assets. And that's what BFA has been going on for many decades now. And it's worked out very well, I think. I think it's been part of the, the whole reason, part of the reason anyway, that the town of Reading has done an excellent job in being physically conservative and is ready for this uh, as much as they can be, as any town can be for what's just happened. Uh, and the RMLD is the same way. I mean, we've got a number of sort of pots of money, funds, et cetera, which were used for things through the oil crisis and other areas that really needed to have investment. And that's why we maintain them. So the prior methodology we had used was basically um, a, um, uh, a CPU type of uh, thing, consumer price index, CPI, uh, that worked for a number of years, but what we found in the last couple of years when we did this study back in 2018 is that our uh, usage in terms of kilowatt hours was actually declining and yet our costs were increasing and we had a huge amount of maintenance we still had to put into the system because it just didn't happen in previous years. So it was almost a perfect storm for us and we call it a convergence because our revenues are slightly going down, our costs are going up and we can't afford to keep making the payment to the town the way we've made it in the past. So very difficult situation for all of us to be in, right? Because all of us on the board of uh, commissioners are residents of the town of Reading. We wanna make sure that that's being done correctly. By the same token, we serve four towns and we're not the largest supplier of electricity to the system. So uh, in light of that, we've been struggling with this since the end of 2018. Uh, trying to find a methodology that would be appropriate, it would satisfy everyone's needs. Uh, so, and the, everyone's needs, by the way, are all those customers in these four towns. It's the Citizens Advisory Board, which represents the four towns. It's the uh, staff at RMLD, and it's certainly the town of Reading. I mean, it's, this is just top of our list in terms of making sure that we do the right thing. So we've examined and pre have been presented many approaches to how we might solve this. Mark Doxter knows extremely well because he provided half of them staying up. <laughs> I don't know how many hours you spent on yours, Mark, but <laughs> we've all sort of been there <laughs> quite a few and we, we very much appreciate the, the input. Uh, but none of them quite met uh, the needs of what I've just described and the feedback we've gotten from the Citizens Advisory Board and from also what we're trying to do for the town, et cetera, uh, just didn't seem to make make it uh, right. So we've pulled together what we think is a methodology. It's not, hasn't been uh, accepted yet. As a matter of fact, I've called a special meeting for tomorrow night of the RMLD um, board to go in detail into what is being proposed. And I'm gonna share that with you here very quickly. Um, but um, basically it's to try to get to closure on this. And so we all kind of know what is in place and to try to push it through perhaps by our May board meeting. So what, what are we doing? Uh, what are we proposing? The first thing is we're proposing that instead of uh, making our last payment under the present uh, situation where we froze the payment uh, for two years, uh, on July 1st, uh, 2021, we're going to extend that payment to the end of the year. That's what the, one of the proposals is. Yeah, so, I apologize for interrupting. Um, the information John is about to present is available on the rmld.com website, um, okay. and you can view it here as well. There's actually another um, presentation, Mark, I, I think you're sharing this. Um, it's in the supplemental packet for, for tomorrow's, for their meeting tomorrow, um, if everyone wants to, to open that up. Thanks, John. That's correct. Thank you very much, oh, Vanessa. That's, that's great. So uh, we start by using something called the kilowatt hour consumption, because there's, it's the purest form of measurement. It's not you know, revenue. It's not any of the other things that can, are downstream. It's really what we're, we're in business to do. We take the, and it's measured exactly. So we know our total kilowatt hour consumption, and we're suggesting that what we do is we take a um, three-year weighted average. So that's a historical weighted average of the kilowatt hour consumption and then multiply this by a variable called mills per kilowatt hour. And the reason we multiply it by that is because there are industry benchmarks that talk to 
uh, what all of the other municipals in Massachusetts and across the country use as a measure of, of providing revenue sources to their towns. And it typically at max goes into about three mills or so, maybe just a little bit over. What we're proposing is using 3.875 mills per kilowatt hour, which is substantially above the benchmark uh, as a mechanism for basically putting in place a calculation for this formula. And the reason we're doing this or suggesting this is we're not doing it yet. We haven't gotten approval. There's no motion to approve this yet. It is to have a very simple formula that's easily tracked and we can see what's happening with very, very simple calculations. Uh, so the three-year average of the kilowatt hours is a huge aid in, in helping to roll out any major change in consumption that might have with coronavirus, um, with uh, weather conditions. And by the way, mild weather, such as we've had in the recent winter, so far are far outweighing you know, any other variable in the system. There are multiple variables, the variables that we, it's very, very difficult to kind of peel them apart and understand which one does what to whom. And the other one is like uh, energy consumption has been going down because of LEDs. You use a tenth the amount of power, right? And we're all having in our homes and businesses. And as a matter of fact, the RMLD puts programs in place to help both commercial, industrial uh, customers everywhere in our, our four town area to put in the most energy efficient things that they could sort of counterintuitive, right, to in terms of running a business. Why are you helping people consume less power? But that's the way, that's what our charter is, is to help the communities that we're in and maintain very, very low rates. So all of those three or four different things uh, have, um, well, may have an impact in terms of what the total is. But the one thing we can measure on a historical basis, anyway, at the end of every year, is how many kilowatt hours are out there. And then we can kind of decide what to do with it. The good thing about this, as I mentioned, is that if there is an impact, if there's a drop of you know, 5% or 8% in terms of the COVID, and by the way, we haven't seen that happen yet. If there is a drop in our kilowatt hour consumption, this three-year rolling average smooths that out. So there's not a huge impact to the town in terms of the payment that we would suggest. As a matter of fact, uh, it also helps the town if we can get our economic development program together to actually increase the electrical usage because the same thing happens in reverse. The number paid to the town goes up and it's, it's, a, it's just a very impressive sort of way of thinking about not letting something impact you immediately where you have to do something very dire uh, to, to con confront it. Now we've got certain, um, the programs that are in the capital program, which are above the uh, line, um, a few of those might get deferred, but for the most part, we're replacing this, yes, thank you very much, Mark, for showing that. We have to do this maintenance. We can't have the transformers blowing up. They're, they're 15 to 20 years old, they're end of life. We've got to maintain them. We've got a six to $8 million program to put in a substation, which should have been put in a year and a half to two years ago to service our biggest customer over in Wilmington. We can't, we can't survive without doing that. And so those are things that are moving forward immediately. We've got the funds to do it. and. Our general manager, Colleen O'Brien, is moving forward on those. So tomorrow, Carl's RMLD meeting uh, will be addressing this, and we're going to be doing live, um, you know, question and answer, which is the second part of the, the second chart that's being put up, uh, just to say that what if we increase um, the RMLD usage by one percent? What if we have a COVID impact of one year uh, for 2020? And then the next year, it's back to business as usual. So we've got a spreadsheet. We've got the, all the numbers in it. We can easily put in plus one, minus one. It ripples through. It shows you what the, uh, the results are. And just doing a quick calculation, if we were to hold steady, hold steady in terms of kilowatt hour usage uh, over the next five years, uh, the additional payment to the town would be on the order of $300,000 as cumulative. So... We're trying not to impact what we've got for you today. We're trying to make it feasible to get more money, if at all possible, tied to the economic development of the town. And if there is a hiccup, this long lasting hiccup, we're doing our best to mitigate it in any way we could possibly can. So um, that's kind of where we're headed. I'd be happy to take any questions. Board members have questions, comments? 
Hi, Mark, I'll weigh in. Um, so to provide a little background for those watching at home, um, this has been an ongoing conversation between the select board and the RMLD commissioners. Um, it has been discussed in front of town meeting as well. Um, if uh, Mark, if, if you don't mind putting on the screen the other PDF attachment, uh, that might be more helpful. Yeah. Um, Tell me which one it is. I just looked on, on the site. I didn't see it. Is it in the, the packet, not in the... Uh... It's, um, it's a separate uh, post. It should be on the... Actually, it's on the internal show. It's on the RMLD website. Uh, okay. It is on the RMLD website. Um, Mark, you go to rmld.com under Board of Commissioners and click on the supplemental attachment for the, their April 30th meeting. Um, and the reason I mentioned that one, so there, you know, uh, John did explain there are there are two issues here that the commissioners will be voting on. One is extending the current arrangement um, with the payment we have, which is at approximately two point four eight million through the end of the calendar year. Um, previously, it had been agreed to be kept until the end of the fiscal year for us, which is June. Right. Um, um, so that's that's item one. Yes, exactly that one um, mark so um you know mark i know you had worked to present some alternative proposals that would provide some guardrails um i know the commissioners and the cab were um uh had decided not to pursue those they those would have provided a bit of a min a minimum and a maximum for what the town could expect um, so as we look at this chart here, what we see is that there is the possibility for fluctuation um, at the order of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, over the course of several years, depending on, on the usage um, that, that John mentioned. Um, and there has been a decreasing trend in usage. The likelihood at this point um, it's, it's always tough to predict the future, but from everything I've heard at our multi meetings is that um, the likelihood of a drastic increase is, is not necessarily something um, we can rely on at this point in time, unless there's some significant development in, in one of the four towns. Um, there, like I said, though, there has been this downward trend and I, I appreciate that the RMLD um, is investing in infrastructure and making sure that we get the great service, continue to get the great service that we do. Um, but I am a, a little apprehensive about the changes, that the numbers that, that are visible in this chart um, in that over the course of, you know, approximately five years, that payment, depending on the impact of COVID by the end of the year and, and continued decreases could see a drop of, you know, I'm looking here, seventy thousand um, dollars to the town budget, and that's a that's a police officer, that's a teacher, that funds would need to be found elsewhere. So I I appreciate that we're we're trying to reach a compromise here, um, but I'm a little nervous about what this means for our, our long term budget impacts. If I may, Ms. John, um, there's there's no question that there's. Uh, there, I, uh, we, we can't guarantee the future. You can't guarantee the future. We can't guarantee the future. Um, we are uh, subject to perhaps even more variables than in town in terms of who we serve and whether they are part of the 20 year agreement and whether we can continue to purchase the power at the rates we've been able to in the past and whether we have any nationally major emergencies uh, that would come in. Thereby, we have to be very fiscally conservative. I would argue that if you're looking out five years and seeing it $10,000, $20,000, um, that's in the noise level. We're talking $2.4 million, $2.5 million. And my hope is that we'll find ways during that period of time to make that a moot point and we'll increase that number instead of decreasing that number. So, you know, the spreadsheets show one thing. The one thing I can only guarantee you about these spreadsheets is that none of them are correct, right? None of them are correct. And as a matter of fact, if you were to, the usual way we'd approach this is to do a Monte Carlo analysis and say, somewhere in that cloud, there's a number that's correct. This is our sort of nearest approach to it, uh, to be able to at least show and get people's reasoned opinions about, does this methodology work? And 
that's what we're really struggling with is trying to find a methodology that's simple, straightforward, and tries to, and by the way, you'll notice that in the first year after 2020, excuse me, 2022, 22, 20, tongue tied, 2022, the number actually goes up, right? So it goes up to 2.5 million in that particular year. So it can go either way, depending on what the glitches are that are happening. And in each one of these cells, we have an explanation about what could happen and what could not happen. And we're, we're more than welcome to, please, anybody who would like to share their thoughts with us, join us tomorrow, uh, we'll plug and play. Uh, you wanna try some different scenarios? No problem, but we've been, been around the block here for about two years with not just Reading, but with the other three towns that we serve. And we have to be cognizant that, you know, they, they are 80% of the load. We're 20% of the load. So we have to be, we're all in this together and we're trying to work this out together. So it's, it's just, hopefully that's a, a reasonable explanation. Go ahead, Anne. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, and thank you, Mark. I'm remembering the proposals that Mark had put together, uh, together with our capable town accounting staff. Um, and, and I'm remembering the concepts, one of the concepts that was, uh, that was utilized was looking at, I think it was called bands where you don't go above a certain amount or below a certain amount kind of pro providing some amount of predictability and protection for both the town and RMLD. So I'm, I'm curious why that wasn't embraced or, or what about that approach didn't work for RMLD? The um, part of the feedback we had gotten from the uh, Citizens Advisory Board was that they did not want it to be revenue based because there's so many different things that can happen or get to in a revenue-based calculation. There are all kinds of variables that could be placed in it and uh, changed, uh, if you will. Um, but if you dealt with something that was kilowatt hour based, then that's fine uh, because it's, it's measured on the meters and there's no ambiguity associated with it. Uh, as far as having um, the... Um, what do you call them, the, uh, the guardrails, I believe that uh, Vanessa had called them, in terms of it, we didn't really understand what those guardrails were accomplishing. Because if you were in a situation where you had, let's say three or four years worth of, not minus 1% per year, but minus 5% per year, because COVID came back and strong and you know we were in this for three more years, which is almost unimaginable, then, you know, then, then quite frankly, all bets are off. I mean, it's not just the town that's suffering. RMLD can't maintain its surface level either. So having those types of guardrails in didn't really serve a purpose. And having an upper guardrail in terms of payment to the town, we thought was not good for you because if if we do to get um, you know, economic development, why would you want to have an upper guardrail? Why wouldn't you want to realize as much as you possibly could from the, the methodology? And by the way, everybody would be happy because it means all of our kilowatt hour sales would be go up. All the three other towns in the above the line payment would also go up and rise and it'd be, be great. I mean, everybody would be dancing in the streets. So we didn't just didn't see the logic of the guardrails is what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Sure. Other questions, comments? Mark, yeah. Uh, um, not to um, put words in Mark's mouth, but um, when those were first put forward, the idea and um, was to um, essentially help protect the town from any sudden decrease, um, something unpredictable, like say COVID nineteen, um, so that there would be some. Um, consistency in what the town could expect because it is quite a bit of money um, that the town does rely on. So um, that had been the proposal. Uh, it apparently was um, not of interest, unfortunately, but um, you know, I, I think John is right. This is something we need to move forward with. Um, I, I think it, it's going to need to be revisited um, as we come out of COVID-19 and, and see where this formula leads us. Um, you know, my concerns stand that this is um, uh, 
this could negatively affect our budget moving forward. This, um, Vanessa, this is a compromise. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I find that in my business career over you know, the last 40 years, um, compromises are really kind of what you get to in negotiations, and it's what keeps the enterprise going. Um, for having you know, hard demands one side versus the other doesn't really move the ball forward. You have to compromise. And, and I think with our other three towns, uh, if they agree to this um, and moving it forward, uh, I think we'll be in very good shape. Um, and again, uh, your, your point's exactly right. It can be re-examined uh, at any point in time. So um, it's, it's a way just to, to get off the dime and do it in a very logical, simple, easy to understand way and move it forward. And the, again, the previous methodology we use, it just ran out of steam. It just, it was bankrupting us, just couldn't keep it going. So it had to, we have to have a change. And so, uh, and, and notwithstanding, Mark did a fantastic job, by the way. We did look at spreadsheets and we went through it, but there are other compelling reasons. And that's why I said compromise that it wouldn't be on a revenue basis. Just if I could for a sec, just to kind of reiterate a couple of things. Um, we, we have been working on this to, to come up with a, what we think is a, you know, a solution that, that can work at least for some period of time. You know, the, the one side of the story and, and tonight was actually a really good example of kind of showing what that is, is that costs continue to go up no matter, kind of no matter what, even in the face of, of things being really difficult financially, the costs continue to go up. The previous formulas that we had in place were, were meant to understand that a little bit and to have some allowance that those costs are going to go up and, and that's how we'd set the adjustment mechanism. Um, you know, John talked a little bit about conversions and some other things going on, you know, their costs are going up, how things are managed. There, there are a lot of different things that go into that. Some of the proposals that we put forward focused on um, looking at, at essentially the need to have a cost escalator. And that's why revenue was the item that we were looking at. And, you know, I, I understand from, from both sides of that what's going on. Um, you know, the net is that the, the money we're getting in real dollars kind of, you know, adjusted for inflation and costs will we'll be going down a little bit under this formula unless demand goes up dramatically. And, you know, dramatically is more than just kind of, I think, new residential housing. I think it's it's new, substantial new development or, or, or something else like that. So it, my, my take on this at this point is that um, we do want to move something ahead. Uh, I think the idea, I, I like the idea of, of, of bands very much and, and not because it limited the top side, I can assure you, I'd love for it to go up, <laughs> but because it kind of, it, it allowed us to do planning in a, in a pretty straightforward manner, uh, knowing that it wouldn't go below a particular number, again, you know, barring craziness that happens in the world. Um, and, and that would have been an interesting approach as well. Uh, and you know the feedback, and I, and I have been involved in these meetings and listening, ha, has been so far from the other communities um, and, and the CAB. Um, they, for some reason, revenue didn't bother them a bit. And it may be that over time that's something that we should talk more about, but I think in the short term, it, it wasn't working for them. Um, and so that's kind of what, kind of where I think we are at the moment personally. Yeah, and, and that's where we got to the, the whole issue of compromise, Mark. I mean, you know, in terms of trying to find something that everybody can live with, and and again, I I, I know I, I know you want predictability. By the way, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, if you if the rates remain this constant, it, you you would get cumulatively three hundred thousand dollars more out of this. If it went pos positive one percent, even it's significantly more than that. So on an upside, it's it's very positive on an upside. And it's not as bad on the downside because we've got the three-year weighted average working for us. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, Mark. We're going to be kicking this around tomorrow night. You're, anyone is welcome to join us, obviously. And we'd, we'd love to have your participation if you care to join us. Karen had a comment then, Bob. Thank, thank you, John, and thank you, Mark. Um, so I do like the the three-year rolling average. Um, you never know what's going to happen or what's going to hit us. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for us um, around 
green energy usage and electrification. And so you're thinking, I'm thinking back 20 years ago, gas was the clean energy. So it's been proven that is not the clean energy. Um, electric, our own RMLD, is very, very clean energy, doing like amazing things in terms of wind power, solar, hydropower, really, really being with the curve or ahead of the curve and certainly um, coming up to speed and matching what the state is doing and what states around the country are mandating. So there's tremendous opportunity here in a formula that does allow rewards for everyone who go, who goes down this path. And um, I've attended CAB meetings and, you know, they, they care about the costs. They care about the payments for their budgets. Um, and those are kind of the primary drivers and the oh, excuse me and the reliability and the service levels which which are tremendous and remain so so we're all lucky about that um the question i wanted to ask um our town manager bob lullisher to um sort of weigh in on his thoughts because you know is this something that you can see the town getting on board with and 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 looking for ways to use this electrification as a way to meet our, our green energy and clean energy initiatives? Well, I, I want to start by asking, um, both John and Vanessa have made the same statement, so I want to ask a question. Um, if uh, lower sales have pushed you in this direction, uh, agree that the future is completely unpredictable, what has the past rate of decrease been, roughly? over some period of time, three years, five years, 10 years? Um, we'd have to, I'd have to uh, defer to uh, uh, Colleen to give us the actual numbers, but the last maybe three years, there was about a 1% drop in two of the years, and then it sort of stabilized. Uh, and that might be a reflection of the fact that people within our served territory have come to a certain level in the industrial front, have put in as many you know, adjustable frequency drives as they can, and people have already converted for the most part to LED bulbs, in which case it, in which case it becomes relatively stable. And then that begs the question of, you know, what, what can we do to, to get more energy usage? And the big one, the big one by far is uh, automobiles, right? And we, so we track that I mean, religiously in terms of the penetration curves of electric and you can you can probably find a curve for you, they, they, that satisfies you from four different sources out there, but the problem is it's still about five years away to have to have it make a very significant impact. Uh, so we're going through this period of you know the maintenance and the large maintenance uh, that we have to put in place. Uh, the coronavirus impacting us. Maybe our rates are uh, our usage is stabilized. Don't know yet. Weather has a big impact. We had a mild weather, one of the warmest on record last year, which impacted us. But fall might be very cold. And this has happened time before. If there's one thing we're not going to do is predict the weather, because even the even the huge computers that the government uses can't predict the weather. So, so for us to, to pretend that we can, and then what it does, that balances things out actually in the system. So uh, trying to answer your question, Bob, is what we've seen in the past is, you know, like a minus one, minus 0.8%, then a stabilization in the last year. So will that stabilization move forward? We certainly hope so. Uh, but again, we can't tell you, based on our knowledge base, that it's going to. I can tell you in about five years to seven years, the number is going to be up dramatically because I do believe electric vehicles are going to be uh, taking over from internal combustion. I appreciate the answer, but I, I fail to understand your statement about it. it's been bankrupting us. Um, the CPI has been growing at less than 1% a year. So at worst, you're looking at a 2% loss a year, which is about twenty-five or $50,000. When this, when this was for, first presented to me over a year ago, it was a cut of a half a million dollars. Um, we've come a long way. So I just have never really understood the fundamental issue is my problem. Um, well, why don't we take that offline, Bob, and we'll try to share that with you at some other, at some other point. Excuse me? We'd be happy to share that with you at some other time. Let's do it offline. Well, this board, as water sewer commissioners, have a lot of the same issues you do. Uh, we're encouraging people to conserve water to, so we sell less. And then we have to, you know, the board has to raise rates. So we understand the, the theory quite well. 
and this board has to suffer the same things you do when there's conservation. Um, but it's really hard for me to make much of a statement long term because I really don't understand the issue. Well, that's that's the intricacies of being a utility. Mm. I'm pretty good at math. There's a lot, lot more involved than just the math in running a utility. Mm -hmm. uh, John, okay. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, as we talk about the, the financial situation of RMLD um, and, and the bankruptcy statement sort of surprised me as well. But, um, you know, I know that the town, when we've been faced with, with financial constraints, um, have had to make challenging staff cuts. I'm, I'm curious um the efforts rmld has made in that regard in which regard i'm sorry i didn't, I didn't understand in regards to staffing have there been any staffing cuts um if anything if that's a, we, we perhaps, I, I understand we're perhaps one of the most well-run organizations in terms of a uh, municipal uh in the entire state we are still down about i'll have to ask colleen how many but at least I would say five to six engineers that we've been trying to fill since forever. Uh, it's been very difficult. We are, we are understaffed, if anything, in running the organization. So there is, there is no place to cut uh, money out of the organization. Raising rates, of course, that's a, certainly a possibility as uh, Bob was alluding to, um, but you know, our, our, the charter of the RMLD is to provide the lowest possible cost and, and the power that we receive is a pass-through, right? So what we do is we have a staff that is superb at doing future purchases of power. And the reason we can do that is because it's four towns doing it in a group setting, in a scale-based, rather than one town. If Reading were to try to do that just on their own, it, would, it would just wouldn't happen. The rates would skyrocket in terms of the, the electricity cost to all of our residents. We can do it because of scale issues. Yeah, I think that's a great point, John. There, there's definitely a benefit in um, economies of scale. I think for those watching at home um, who may not know uh, as much about the history, it's it's worth noting um, uh, the RMLD, um, uh, while it operates as a separate entity um, from the town of Reading, and it obviously has its own um, elected officials and the commissioners, um, the town of Reading is... Uh, does have a liability from having the, uh, a municipally owned utility. Um, and this is a liability that the other three communities who benefit from the, the economies of scale that, that John was talking about earlier, um, they, they don't share that. So that is another factor when we talk about the payment and why Reading receives it. Um, and that's a significant factor of it too. Um, so Mark, I, John, I, I really do appreciate you coming to the meeting and, and putting the proposal in front of us so that the board could reflect on it. Um, Mark, I know there's numerous other things on the agenda, so I, I want to be sensitive to that. Um, yeah. One comment, Bob, I didn't exactly get an answer to my question tonight. So, but if you want to- I, I answered your financial question. What was the other part? <laughs> so we have a great opportunity with a large amount of uh, influence over our local utility, which uh, which national grid customers do not have. And we have a, a utility that is very interested in selling more kilowatts. And he, John's correct about the electric cars are coming. And, and um, you know, kudos, John, by the way, thank you again for coming. And kudos for the new rebate programs that you're putting out there. If anybody's considering an electric lawnmower, you absolutely should get one. They are fantastic. And um, so... So we hope we can do a little persuading and, and push Bob along this curve. <laughs> I, think that we'll I still haven't it. heard the question. Are you asking us to buy more power? Yeah, through electrification. Yep. And meet We're our green, like green all of of customers. That's that's been our mandate. Is this is a, a topic I think that's a little separate yeah. from from this discussion, but is worthy <laughs> of another date. <laughs> um, so. In terms of our agenda for tonight, there are actually two topics related here, and, and John has talked about um, both a little bit. So the first part is the payment, which is what's now called the below the line, and that is going to be coming uh, to a special meeting our, of the RMLD commissioners tomorrow evening. Is it 7 o'clock, John, or 7.30? Yes, it's uh, 7 o'clock, 7 to 8 o'clock, and it's really to discuss 
this this next formulation basically in terms of what it could bring and allow uh, the commissioners to to test it in different ways and to see if it's the if we're finally to a point where it makes sense to recommend this moving forward. Good, great. So if there are no, citizens, there's, there's no um, there's no motion tomorrow. Right. So it's, it's discussion. So citizens that, that have interest in, in discussing this and bringing it up are certainly welcome to um, go uh, participate in the meetings and emails, uh, however, to absolutely your concerns on that. So that's kind of piece one. Piece two relates to the 20 year agreement, which has a 10 year renewal uh, cycle to it, I guess, is, is where it is. Right. Yeah. And um, so it has it's come into the board. Um, I don't know what the status is with other communities. Um, I think that uh, when I want to make sure that town council is able to take a quick look at it just to make sure there's nothing that we're- Mark, if I could mention, uh, Wilmington did approve it. Wilmington did. Yes. Okay. All three, right. all three communities have approved it. Okay, they have. Okay, so um, what it will require at some point is the signature of all of, all of us. The select board will have to sign uh, the document if we're in agreement with it. So. Um, not on tonight for for a vote but more for a discussion um and then i think we should just bring it to our next meeting you know unless anybody has other comments about it go ahead Ann, i'm sorry you're muted bring it to our next meeting for a vote yes okay. yeah i think the any feedback we get from town council but other than that um, we should probably bring it forward all right anything else on this we move on uh, Mark, I just have, sorry, just one comment. Um, Bob, has Ray had a chance to review this? I'm assuming this is pretty straightforward, but. I don't know. I don't know, actually. I haven't sent it to him. So okay. I, I can easily do that and he can easily review it. Yeah, why don't we do that just in case he has anything else? I, I can't imagine there's anything there to cause concern. But, no, I um, don't think so. Yeah. Um, but just if we can have that. Okay. Check mark done before our next meeting. That would be helpful. Sure. Thanks very much. Great. John, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Our pleasure. Um, okay, let's go back on the agenda to uh, discussion of liaisons. And um, in your packet was a, uh, a summary and a suggestion that I put together that I'm going to try to put up on screen now as well. So what I did is uh, we had talked about what I call here in the, uh, the left-hand column, formal liaison activities. And I think these are the ones that I, I wrote down. Uh, it started with the uh, three basically priorities uh, that each of us put in. And then there were some uh, pieces that we were still working on and others where we expressed a preference, things like the audit committee for me and things like that. So I tried to summarize that here. Um, and then I created, uh, I guess, sorry, I'm using the terminology from before the below the line. And the below the line is connection with chair and vice chair. Our discussion had been that there'd be um, a limited number of groups that we'd try to work uh, a bit more closely with and, and monitor more closely. Um, and then the other ones, although still you know, quite important in the scheme of things, we'd establish a relationship with chairs and vice chairs so that they knew where to go if there were questions uh, or comments. So what I, at that point is I kind of um, just started shuffling the cards around a little bit to see what, what would make sense to be able to share the load uh, between the five of us. And so this is what I came up with. Anybody have comments on, on what's here? Mark? Yes. I'm not complaining, but Am I on ZBA with Vanessa, or is are we taking it on together? So we kind of left that as a second person was a question mark. Okay. Uh, is where we left it at the last meeting. So that's the reason I put it here. Okay. I'm okay with everything that I see for me, um, unless someone wants to trade or do rock, paper, scissors, um, whatever. <laughs> Other. It's all right. 
Thanks for putting this together, Mark. It looks good. You're welcome. Is this something we need to formally vote on, or is it something we just agreed to, or how do we how do we take this forward? So I do, before moving forward, just one question: um, where Vanessa and I are both are both communications. Does that mean we anticipate continuing with the communications subcommittee? I just want to make to confirm whether that's um, if that subcommittee we haven't voted to disband it, so I don't know if we need to vote to disband it, and then we can operate in separate silos. Yes. So, and I, I, if I remember correctly from our last meeting, we agreed to disband it um, with one side being resident and town manager communication, the other side being social media. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, Mark, we need to put that as a separate agenda item to probably approve the final minutes. Yes. That would <laughs> be a disband. Mm hmm Okay, I'm going to disband and then I'm, I'm going to call it restructure. But what I mean by that is, is your comment that there's kind of an internal communications and an external communications. Um, and that those would be separated or conceivably those are separated. I don't know that I would, I would um, classify them in that way because I think some of the communications that I would be looking at could also be considered external um, between the board and the public. Okay, so uh, board staff public as opposed to more... Uh, email, I'd say email communications with the board and communications with the town manager. Bob, did I see your hand? Oh, I think you're just turning... Uh, I, just, I just wanted to add that uh, past boards, some have voted on this, some have not. I don't think there's a right and a wrong. Um, quite often the chair just sort of made an assignment. These are okay. Let's if do there's it. There's no disagreements. I don't see that we necessarily need a vote. I mean, this all looks fine to me. So we'll come back around the corner on communications. Oh, right. Right. So we'll have to do that. And we'll have to do that at a future meeting. Mm -hmm. And we can come back and make adjustments here. That's my suggestion. Mark, is, is next week, uh, I know we'll discuss agenda items later, but is next week still to talk about our moving the social media? policy forward page or whatever you want to call it is that for next week yeah so i think um next meeting um we, we should talk about that in, in a few minutes in terms okay. of what it should be but yes and and uh i was i think supposed to send something out uh the three points and i'm going to have to review the video to get the three points and then i'll send it out after i had i'm able to do that sorry that's on me okay um so the other thing I was going to suggest with this is that we, we do one more commercial advertisement for folks that want to volunteer, encouraging people that there are going to be lots of opportunities. We have lots of openings um, for volunteering on different communities, and we would love to get more community participation. Um, and it's very easy. You can just go to the, the website, and down in this corner here in the yellow, you can see where it says volunteer opportunities. You can click on that. And it takes you to um, volunteer opportunities. You go to volunteer application. And there it is. It's online. You can send it in. And please indicate all the areas you might have some interest in. And just a little bit of background about you as to kind of who you are, why you might have some interest. Um, clearly, if there are folks who have some uh, really good background in some of these areas, we'd love to, to tap your, your skills and, and bring it forward here. So thank you for that. Um, let's see. What else do I have on here? That was your MLD. Um, so before I jump to future topics, any more discussion on volunteers? You're okay, go ahead, Carlo. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I saw Carlo first. Yeah. Go ahead, Carlo. Caitlin, can you give us an update on the responses? Yes, uh, we are waiting for about six more responses, but other than that, we've heard from everyone. And and out of those. Not including those six, is everyone re-upping? No. No, okay. Um, I, I don't have the exact number. Most are, but there's a few that have term limits that are expiring, and so they can't re-up. Um, but most are, I will say. But there are a few that aren't. All right. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. We, we wanted to 
kind of get a number by the end of this month, uh, which is coming up, correct? Yeah, um, so as close as we could, the, I think the the uh, the deadline was that folks would have stuff in now. We're almost there. It sounds like we need to kind of wait one more, one more click. Right. Yeah, so Jackie started reaching out, doing like a double, our, our follow-up email um, yesterday. She sent out follow-up emails to the people we hadn't heard from which was, I think, nine people. And then out of the nine, we had like three or four respond right away. So then we're just down to the last few. Yep. And uh, in terms of timing, other than finance committee, um, would these appointments take place, um, is it for, for July 1st? Is that the July, effect? July 1, all the terms expire on June 30th. Okay. So Caitlin, I'm also curious, for the vacancies, have we received app, uh, excuse me, applications for the vacancies that we currently have? Um, we have a, we got a few for finance committee. Um, I ha would have to check on any others. Um, I haven't seen many come through. I, we got one tonight, actually, but I didn't see what committee it was for. Um, but we have not gotten very many. We have a few for FinCom. So I think we, we need to do a bit more advertising uh, before we close all the nominations, I think is what it sounds like here. <laughs> okay. So I think we should talk this up uh, as much as we can, encourage people to get engaged. There are all, all different boards, committees, opportunities, uh, and we'd love for people to you know, make this either one of your first entrees into local government. It's kind of a, a, not a heavy lift to, to get into it. Or for folks who have been involved before, please come back. Um, <laughs> we're, we're looking for folks that, that want to be helpful here and, and uh, you know, care about the town, taking it forward and want to participate that way. So please, please send in your applications. Uh, future topics. So I, we talked a little bit more uh, about public comment being something that we want to get onto the agenda. The communications policy may not be exactly right, but it's, it's your point, Carlo, and it's also your points, Ann and Vanessa. It's communications, uh, all aspects, uh, and we probably want to break that into some pieces. Um, we need to hear from Sharon Angstrom at some point and get the quarterly report. We probably should do that sooner. Uh, it's not critical instantly, but I think that's something we want to get there. Um, capital plan and priorities, especially given uh, recent changes, but it's very important to talk about priorities. I think how we see some of the priorities, and we've also talked about how to gather public input about some of those priorities. So I think that should be an agenda item that we can talk through and then uh, maybe even assign a person to, to think about it and come back with ideas on how to get that going. Um, obviously having some hearings would be a great way to do it, but um, even before that, we can certainly ask people to start, we can share with them, here are some ideas and ask them to give us some feedback. Um, last but not least on this was, I call it town meeting task force, but this was just the notion of looking at some different technology options. Um, Nominally, I, I'm, I think I'm kind of leading that uh, at the moment, um, but trying to get some folks involved thinking about what are the different remote participation options. Um, I did bring it up at the command meeting on Monday. Um, and obviously, if there's anything other than just remote, they need to be very involved in that. Um, understanding what it is, they have a, a planning structure in place and they need to be very engaged. So, um, you know, good that we're having the discussion. Um, I think the group was okay exploring technology, but when it gets to people in buildings, they absolutely need, want and need to be involved. Anything that I haven't put on here that you see kind of next few meetings or even beyond? Mark, is, the RML, is there an RMLD um, vote placeholder in May? Last, uh, the last Sorry. time it was agreed to, uh, it, it occurred on May 16th, like mid-May. Um, yes, that needs to be there. Okay. Sorry. I, I didn't know if I missed it, if you already have it on there. Thank no, it, it needs to be there. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Sorry, I can, uh, actually, I can put this back onto the screen. Hang on. Sorry, I just have too many windows open at the moment. <laughs> Mark, while you're searching, I'll put in a, a plug. We normally do the uh, PT, PTF meetings quarterly. Um, we did get an email earlier today from someone um, on a topic, uh, on a street safety topic that, that has come before the board previously. 
Um, I, I hesitate to put that on too soon, given um, the heavy workload that police and fire already have, and we rely heavily on them for these updates. Um, so perhaps not uh, immediately, but something to keep on our radar. Yeah, uh, Bob, maybe you could come back to us with a uh, suggestion on when when the timing would be good for that. I will. Um, the PTTF typically meets monthly. Um, we haven't met in two months, and we don't plan to meet for another month at least. Um, so we need to meet before we can discuss it with you. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, police is aware of the complaint, aware of the issue. Um, they have uh, gone and, and done some surveys. We'll continue to do that. Um, I guess my only comment in public at this point, which is a typical one in many parts of the town, is um, sometimes residents don't know that the street they live on is a 30 mile an hour speed limit by default. And 30 can seem quite fast in neighborhoods with little kids. So it's, it's, it could be unsafe, or it could be seem unsafe, but that doesn't mean that someone's actually speeding, just to keep that in mind. It's worthy of investigation. I, I, I know this yeah. neighborhood fairly well. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing for your agenda is water and sewer hearing. Yeah. Great. Go ahead, Dan. Um, I would love for us to be able somewhat soon, yeah, you know, maybe by June, um, to to have a board retreat um, led by Jane, if she's available and interested in, in doing that for us again, um, where we can talk about ground rules for how we um, interact with each other as a board and represent the community, um, as well as uh, setting goals for ourselves and keeping ourselves accountable to those goals. Um, I think it's also this we may be waiting on something from right here but to talk about um about pol a policy for public hearings um not i think not entirely unrelated um we had i think early on in this pandemic talked about boards commissions and committees com committees not meeting unless unless necessary um, but this is going to be going on for a long time. It already has, and it and it very well will for a long time. And so, and we have a lot of technology uh, in place. And so, I don't know if that that was a kind of our initial frame at the as we started getting up and running with our own meetings. But I, I don't know if you know as liaisons to these other boards, commissions, and com committees now we're still saying I would I would actually encourage us to allow boards commissions and committees to meet if there if there's business if they have business to attend to if they don't certainly it's you know not necessary to meet for just for the per the sake of meeting but if there is business to attend to um, I think we're gonna have to to move forward yeah, I think you actually may have two issues there, though. One of them is just the, the, the meeting itself that takes place at the board and committee. The other is actually having a public hearing take place. They are, they are, um, they are different, but somewhat related. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. I think the notion that suddenly, you know, in, in you know, 30 or 45 or 60 days, you know, we're back to normal and, and everybody comes into the room doesn't seem likely at all. Like, right. So, yeah, I think it, it, we need to come up with um, a structure for that, maybe some guidelines, um, and ideally even a, a bit of a how-to, mm -hmm. uh, a structure. It probably makes sense. And, and again, as we're learning more about town meeting and different things, it may be that we're starting to hear what, what other people are doing, what the state is supporting, things like that. Anything else? Good for now. Okay. Um, I'm going to take this off. So we have some uh, minutes to look at. Um, Mark? Sure. Um, I have some edits to the minutes for a couple of these meetings, and I apologize. I, I haven't had the opportunity to send them in writing, which is um, easier, I think, for everyone involved. 
Could I ask if we could review these at our next meeting so that I could include my, um, so I could send my edits to Bob directly? So to me, yes, and <laughs> Anne had an idea that I think has a lot of merit to think about. Anne, do you want to share? Sure. So I sent this to Bob, Caitlin, and Mark immediately prior to the meeting. But as I was going through the minutes, um, I was I was feeling for Caitlin, who's had to put these together, and as someone who has myself had to put together meeting minutes. Um, for uh, in compliance with the open meeting law um, in my as part of my day job. Um, and there generally are kind of two approaches for the way you can put meeting minutes together that are fully compliant with open meeting law. One where you provide kind of like a summary level uh, overview of what was discussed. You're, you know, you make certain that you indicate what decisions were arrived at and who voted it in what way. Um, and then another where you attribute, you know, statements to different commissioners or board members um, as best you can um, and try to provide a very detailed summary of um, what people said when. And I'd say the latter can can become contentious and open to um, more dispute than the former. Um, and as I was going through the draft minutes, I was kind of struggling because I would have written them differently or I would have paraphrased things in a different way. And, you know, I could do, I could probably do a lot of redlining of those minutes for me to feel comfortable with feeling like they pro provide an accurate summary of what, what went down, not to, not to um, put blame on Caitlin because it's a thankless and difficult, difficult task to put these minutes together. Um, but, you know, I was I was looking at the minutes and, you know, thinking I, I would probably change some of the, the paraphrasing of, um, you know, different things that were said in public comment. But that feels uncomfortable because then you're trying to figure out how to represent something that members of the public were saying and they're not here to vote on the minutes either. Um, so I kind of wanted to offer up a, a slightly different approach to 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 our minutes um, where we might think about having more of like a summary level conversation that doesn't require, well, I, you know, I think often we'll, we all go back and look at minutes and say like, well, I didn't quite say it in, the, in this way. And then we'll edit our own comments. Um, but maybe we could provide more of like, this was what this topic was discussed at the meeting. Um, you, you know, these viewpoints were represented. Um, th these decisions were reached and um, these votes were taken and the members voted in this fashion. Um, so I, I th just wanted to offer that up. Um, I, if we do want to go to, for more of the detailed approach, I too will also have to send um, Caitlin um, notes or uh, corrections, which I didn't um, do prior to this meeting. I think I, I, I provided her, Bob, and Mark, um, that sort of frame as uh, as, uh, as a possibility. Um, and I, I think I only offered up one uh, specific example of, of a correction I would make, but I, I would have more if we do want to go to the, to, um, the detail um, level in our minutes. How do people feel philosophically about the structure, Ken? Mark, I have a comment and a question. Um, so the comment is, in this day and age, when we can go back and look at the video online, I we could give Caitlin a break, and exactly everything's there. We're not losing the data. RCTV does a great job of capturing this. Anybody can go through and watch it and relive it, like, multiple times. And uh, this is good for the Finance Committee, the Select Board, CBDC, a number of committees. So I, I, I like Ann's approach. Um, and the question I have is... Um, this has come up on the finance committee before, but how does the select board do have new members vote on minutes where they weren't participants as board members? So uh, maybe we'll talk about the former first. <laughs> Actually, talk about the latter first. Um, so we've left it open. Um, you can uh, either abstain. What's happened is people either have abstained or they have voted to approve. I don't think I've ever experience someone vote against the minutes after not having been there. Um, and we, it has been, to my knowledge, uh, left up to people to decide what they want to do without any prescription given. Is that pretty much it, Rob? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Karen, to give you a little perspective, I've abstained from voting for minutes in meetings that I didn't attend and for one reason or another didn't watch. Um, and I have voted if, for minutes in meetings that I didn't attend, but um, uh, did watch in hindsight and agreed with. So it's it doesn't have to be a hard and fast. And as for um, the other issue, and I, I think that's a great idea. I'm fully on board with simply having um, factual summaries of what was discussed, issues raised, and how we voted. I think it would save Caitlin a lot of work. Carla, what do you think? I'm a, I'm a little confused. Are these for the minutes that we need to approve, or this is going forward forever? Yes. I asked two questions. Both. Both. Okay. Um, you know, I'm new to this. I was live for those three meetings and I read all the minutes and they were very detailed and I read minutes from other meetings. So I, I don't want to disparage Caitlin. I understand what Anne is saying, but I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable and maybe because of the subject matter uh, that is bringing this on, but I I like the way it's been done, and yes, we do have video. People were there in person. Board members were there in person, but I, I don't know where this is coming from, other than maybe the subject matter. Well, I think that there'll be a number of amendments to the minutes if we kind of continue with them in the detailed form. Um, I I too would have some comments and, and suggestions on changes that should be made in, in what's there now. So. We could approach it as, okay, that's what we should continue. And then we'll kind of, I'll go through our edits uh, at a future meeting and then we could continue with that path. The notion, however, was what if we instead move toward uh, doing more of a summary form and, and focused on what are the issues? What were the comments? What, what's the subject matter of the comments that were brought up? What votes were taken? Um, and then it would be a, a, a shorter set of minutes with the ability to check the exact information on video. Well, every meeting's minutes are going to be different, right? Though the, some of those meetings were pretty intense that were on the agenda tonight, and most meetings are not intense at all or very boring. And the minutes, <laughs> the minutes are done. The minutes are done in a matter of minutes. So it's one thing to correct. If Caitlin didn't transcribe something correctly or misquoted somebody, but to go and amend minutes just for the sake of amending them, I really don't agree with. Well, so the problem with that is that if, if we as board members don't agree with what was written, we're not going to vote to approve them. I, I understand that, but I'm saying if it's a correction is a correction. That's fine. I, I didn't say that. Or I meant to say this, and you know everything's in hindsight. But I mean, this is part of our job. I mean, from from what I understand, um, I don't I don't I don't really understand what's going on. So, from experience in the past, um, it's a bit of a painstaking process that involves members, oftentimes checking their own statements and other things, and it it taking several weeks to get minutes to a, a place where everyone was okay with them. So that could be an approach. It just it's going to take longer to get that done. That that is what we've done in the past, um, and it's been painstaking in some cases. I think what Anne's suggesting is a different approach, um, but it would be consistent, you know, across activities. I don't think it was meant to say, "Geez, for these meetings, let's not do it that way." I think it's it's the suggestion. I won't put words into your mouth, Anne, but that this is how we would handle minutes going forward too. That I think that would be my preference. And did I also, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, and would this also translate to other boards and committees and or they do their minutes the way they want to do it? They would do, I think they would do it the way they want to do it. I, I, we should check this, but I believe the school committee does it in the summary format. Pretty That's sure. a great question, Carl. Yeah. I've seen this discussed at um, the Mass Municipal Association as well. Uh, and many other towns also do the abbreviated version. The minutes are not really intended to be a transcript of what happened. They are meant to be a summary record of the actions and decisions that were made by the board. 
Um, and um, the issue of editing minutes um, has been ongoing. And I remember even on my FinCom days, um, you know, members making slight adjustments um, to information that was presented. It's, you know, Anne's absolutely right. It's, it's a really tough job. It is thankless, it, but it's also important to have that accurate record. Um, but I, I think because of the technology and because we have videos that are maintained indefinitely on YouTube, I don't know if we need this level of detail. I, I hadn't thought of it before. I, I think it's a great idea. Is there a level of detail? As someone who has had to be a minute taker, it does save a lot of time for the minute taker. I don't know if... I might raise my hand to be a minute taker if this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> is there a level of detail that is um, is acceptable? In other words, you know, if it just kind of said... Locker provides certain... Inf there's certain information under open meeting law that is required to be included within the minutes. And so you can't shortchange that. So just would it make sense to try it for a set of minutes and see what it looked like so we actually can understand what it would be? Yeah, I, it's, I noted actually, I think to Bob, um, Caitlin and Mark that some of the minutes from one of the meetings, um, actually not the entirety, but one portion of it, one agenda item effectively utilized the approach I'm talking about where we, um, talked about the town manager's evaluation. Um, and Caitlin, I think, used about two sentences to summarize that conversation, which is totally adequate for purposes of open meeting law and was accurate and reflective of, of that portion of the meeting. But it was like an hour-long conversation that was summarized accurately um, by Caitlin in those... Uh, two sentences. I think it was about two sentences. So, Mark, you had suggested um, giving it a try for some of the minutes to see what it looks like. I, I think that's a really good idea. And would you be able to share what the, as an experienced minute taker uh, <laughs> under open meeting law, yeah. would you be able to share the requirements with Caitlin um, so that we could do a draft? Of well aware of them, but I'd be happy to, to share that because I know she's very diligent about providing, you know, people who are members, present members, absent, like that kind of thing is, is required. And I know Caitlin always does a good job of doing that, um, but I can certainly share that and maybe with the board. So um, in a future, for a future packet or something. So everyone knows what's required. I would suggest we, we, we do that. I, I mean, I don't think I'm in a position to say, yeah, let's definitely change. I don't, yeah. I guess I need to see what it might look like and understand if, if that seems to be sufficient or not. I just want to add that this isn't so much a select board issue, but it is the land use boards. Um, there is more precision, precision desirable and sometimes required in public hearings. Um, because if there's future litigation, they go back to the minutes as the record, not the tape of the meeting mm -hmm. quite often. So sometimes there's more detail required. This person said this, you know, and a butter said that. Uh, again, that's not your issue so much, but you can't. You can't necessarily dictate policy to all the land use boards, for instance. And I, and I know you said you didn't intend to. That was not, I was not thinking about right. dictating how other boards, commissions, or committees take their minutes. I don't think there's too many public hearings that you will have that are going to be that kind of an issue, but there could be. Um, you know, if we had a poll hearing or something, that'd be much like a land use uh, issue. So just, just be aware of that possible exception. And we could make that, if, if this summary format works, we could make hearings the exception. Yeah, I, I need to see what this is going to look like. I'm really, you know, I know this is the first time we're talking about it. And I know um, Karen and I are the newest members in the boards, but Karen has been on other boards, so she maybe she's more familiar with this than I am. But I've been to enough meetings and read enough minutes that, you know, I know it's tedious, and like I said, some are more tedious than others, and uh, I'm just a little worried that we're using this point in time of February uh, for a few meetings that we're totally changing the way we do things. So I just want to make sure that there's a good reason to do this, and that we're all in agreement and not in agreement for the wrong reason. 
I, I don't want to just do something just to do something to make it easier for Caitlin. Nothing against Caitlin, but I, I, I you know, I, I haven't gone through minutes yet as a board member. I, I, I have minutes of, I have, we have minutes of our, our, our meetings uh, since March 17th, but there's not much to go over. Um, so I, far. For that. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Carlo. I was, you know, I came to this sort of late in the day today when I was looking at, um, looking at the minutes and starting to go through the task of um, looking at corrections to offer. And they were numerous and will, you know, if we go forward, it, it will be painstaking and painful to go through them. Um, and it, it sort of illustrated, it, it illustrated for me the benefit and having, like I said, having done, taken minutes in both fashions before, it sort of illustrated for me um, the benefit of of taking minutes and approving minutes in a way that, you know, it's just totally straight. It's much more straightforward as to everyone being able to agree on the accuracy um, when we're not trying to, you know, paraphrase what somebody else said and see if it's an accurate reflection of, of their intent. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to try to capture that. Um, and, and all, I think particularly when I was looking at, um, members of the public who had spoken in my recollection and then look, going back and looking at the video and thinking it didn't quite line up with my what I had heard and what they'd said um, but then it felt uncomfortable to think about rephrasing what the public had said and offering a correction there although for me to feel comfortable in approving the minutes as an accurate reflection I would have to offer those corrections but it's it felt uh, inherently uh, uncomfortable. Uh, uh, not that not that you everything we have to do has to be comfortable, certainly. Um, but it, it seemed like unnecessarily uncomfortable. Right, and that, that's kind of my point. I mean, we there was a lot of public input at, at those particular meetings, or a few of them. Mm -hmm. it, it's if every meeting was like that, then I would say this is a great discussion to have, but that was an anomaly that should never happen again, in my opinion, and hopefully will never happen again. But, and I'm happy to discuss this further and, and put it to bed tonight and, and see what you sent um, to Bob and to Mark. But, you know, I, I'm not gonna make a decision, but I, I just don't like where this is going. Mark, can I recommend that we do a test run if you will, um, to review at our next meeting. Yeah, I think that would make good sense and take a look at what, what this summary might look like um, as an option. I think we can also um, start the process of, of kind of uh, looking at, at some of the comments that people would have and kind of understand this. The um, This isn't the first time this has come up, just to be clear. So I remember many meetings last year my first year, where it, it took us weeks and weeks to get minutes approved because there were changes that had to be made and people had to review the tape and go back and forth. It took weeks and weeks to get stuff done. So it's not that it's a one-time thing that's never happened before this way. I'd say last year there, there were a handful at least of times where we went through things like that. So um, that, you know, the impetus would be, is there a better way to do it? And if there is, we should talk about it. Um, if it's too high a summary, my concern would be that somebody going back and looking at the minutes is, is you know, we talked about the RMLD. Wouldn't be sufficient, in my view, as a summary. Doesn't capture anything other than what was already in the in the packet. So that, that wouldn't serve its purpose. But if it went through and said, this was the discussion, and these are the points that were raised, and uh, either no action was taken or the next action is a vote, that would work for me. I don't need to know, you know, Karen said this, John said that, Ann said this, Mark said that, Vanessa said this. I don't need that necessarily. I, so, I think it depends on the topic. I, I disagree. I really think it depends on the topic. I think to summarize someone's comments that were very specific is not fair. I'd rather be specific than summarize something that was very specific. 
You're right. So that means actually going through the tape to be that specific and, and not interpreting. Just to, just to be clear, that that's the level of detail that, that I think you're talking about. If it's going to be an accurate reflection, it's based on the tape. It's based on what was said. Exactly. Right. And that's the... I feel like we're going in circles here. Now yeah, we're back to a transcript, and it's not a transcript. So I, I think we're, we're not ready to, to kind of make a decision, So, and I think appropriately. I think it would be great to take a look at a version um, in summary form, and we can kind of assess, is it accomplishing the goal or not? Um, and then I think we also should could think about some of the edits we're going to make, and, and you know, we'll see what happens when we bring the edits together. Um, and usually what we've done, I think, is we've tried to make our own edits and send them to Caitlin, and then ask her to try to make sense of them and, and bring them together. So should we do go through that ex exercise? I think we should do it for one of them. Um, you now pick a date uh, and, and go through it and start the process and see what it looks like. And, and you know, maybe it's simple. My, my gut is it's not going to be so simple. But let, let's, I think we got to start with that. I think we can't just kind of make a change until we're comfortable with it. Um, can I ask then that the word documents for those three meetings be sent to us so that we can do it and track changes? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Great. I have a question. Um, so am I, are you asking me to rewrite the minutes in a summary version, or are you asking me to do like our next set of minutes as a summary version and see what it looks like? Because I have done all of your minutes up until this meeting. So they're all done, just like waiting. Um, so are you asking me to go back and like rewrite all of those, or are you wanting me to start this going forward? Or I would suggest we take one only and try the summary format and see what it looks like and compare it to the, the, the longer form of it. And so we can get a flavor for what's there. And, and that will help us assess what do we want to do here. Would we want to take, would we want to take one of the me meetings that, uh, that's in this packet and um, do the sort of line by line edits and then would we want to have, rather than Caitlin have to do it, do you want me to try to do a summary level version so we can take it off Caitlin's plate? If you wouldn't mind trying one, that would be great. Okay. And then let's just see what we have, and then we can we can talk about it, and we have a, a little bit of a comparison. And if it merits changing, we can discuss that. And if it doesn't merit changing, you know, I think we should also kind of do our red line version of the ones that were in the packet tonight. Okay. All right, so, so Anne will take it for one meeting, bless you, and we will each uh, kind of take what was in this packet tonight. We'll, if you can send us, Caitlin, just the Word versions of them as opposed yeah. to the PDF. I mean, I don't mind doing that. I was just wanting to make sure that we're on the same page. Yeah, we, we, I think we're trying to see what would it look like, and it doesn't mean doing all of them. It means trying it with one so that we can take a look at it and, and see if, if there's, there's agreement or not. So which meeting, which meeting do you want me to do? Are there preferences? Do we take the hardest or do we take something in between? Uh -huh. I think it should be chronological. We, I think we were having three, to approve three uh, meetings tonight. If I'm, I don't have it in front of me, but was it three? Yeah, I think there are three, three sets, yeah. I mean... I mean, I don't know, chronologically, because that's how we would approve them, yeah, chronologically, right? We don't jump from, we just pick one and approve it, then go backwards and forward, and we go in order. Well, are we just testing this? Like, are we, am I doing this to be have them approved, or are we doing this just to see if we like how it comes out? Or So I, I think we're, we're seeing side by side. The idea is to have a side by side comparison. And we can look at two sets and see the two versions and, and decide if there's a if we prefer one version over the other or how we want to take it going forward. So to see it one time gives us that opportunity. One time meaning one set of minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'll just start with the first one then. The um two four. Two is that what it is? Two four. I think it's two four. Um and then I just have one more um clarification point when 
um, you guys talked about like public comment. Um, do you want me summarizing other people's public comments too, or is that something you want me to leave? I try to, I try to when I do public comment, um, I'm always trying to walk a fine line of too much and not enough. Um, but I feel like when I do public comment, I try to write pretty close to exactly what they say because I don't want to write something that they didn't say. But do you want, are you want me to summarize their comments as well? Or um, do you want me, like, would you rather me put more for theirs? But any preference? <laughs> no, I, I think you're touching exactly on the topic. I know. Uh, in some sense that we're, we're, we're dealing with. Okay. Um, you know, when, when it's just... part, yeah, well, I think let's, let's start with what you already have done. Most importantly, right. Let's start with that. Let's take the two, four minutes, have four minutes, try it in summary form and look at them side by side and see what, what we like and don't like about one format versus the other. In the meantime, I think for two, four to 11 and two nineteen, I think those are the three dates. I think that, uh, each of the board members should take a look at them. And if you've got red line comments, once we get a word version, red line it. Send it back and, and, and let's see, you know, if, if it's really easy and, and, you know, everybody agrees, great. Um, but that may not be what happens. We'll see. Is that all right with everybody? Yes. Yes. Just, I just wanted to offer uh, to do the summary version for 2.4 if that's going to be um, additional burden for Caitlin. Hey, if you want to do it, <laughs> more than welcome, but it, I don't mind um, doing it. Okay. I'm going to ask you to do it, please, Caitlin, for 2.4. Just. And then send the red line version. Sorry, not the red line. The word versions of 2.4, 2.11, 2 2.19, the three that are in the packet tonight. Send those out to the board members. If you have changes, do it in uh, turn on review and put in your red line comments. All right. Um, let's talk about timing for the next meeting. So um, town staff is gonna be very busy over the next couple of weeks in particular, but next singular week uh, in, in very much particular. And Bob had asked a question, You know, is there anything that we feel we have to cover next week or could we postpone uh, to two weeks from tonight? And um, from my perspective, I don't think there's anything that has to happen next week unless there are some significant changes in legislation or, or, or other activities like that. that. That's my gut on things. How do other people feel about that? I'm sorry, do you mean so we don't meet next? Is that what you're referring to? We, we wait, uh, skip a week? Right, skip one week. Okay. Just, just to point out, though, that I think many of you have agreed or want to attend the Tuesday night meeting in virtual well, meeting with other select point. board members. Mm -hmm. if you just forward the agenda. I got it. There's no way you're going to do this in one night. You're going to be at it for days. <laughs> it's a very long agenda. The one that was proposed already that Mark put up? Yeah, we just got it from Wakefield. Oh, that. Oh, that. that. Oh. So the board, you know, if, if you have a quorum, the board may be meeting next Tuesday. Right. Got it. So if it's something that's critical that we need to deal with, will already be uh, posted in that quorum. You could, yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. this is a very long meeting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're ten thirty four. Sorry about that. So, um, so yeah, I, I meant. Oh, you looked at the uh, agenda. Yeah, yeah. tonight's long. <laughs> so, so here's the question: Is it okay with the board? We do not meet next Wednesday unless there's some uh, very important reason why we have to call the meeting quickly. So we, we do not plan a meeting at this point until two weeks from tonight. Could you put the slide up again? Just sorry for the topics that we were discussing. Sorry. Yeah, and, and these, by the way, aren't all necessarily um, on one night. No, right, right. No, I just want to, yeah, yeah, that's all. Yeah, no, I... I because I, I know yeah. you, I know you mentioned Mark that you know you want to get the town accountant <coughs> report you know sooner than later. Um, I, I thought we agreed all of us to do the RMLD vote next week. 
I thought we agreed upon that. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Well, we said next meeting. Oh, next meet. Okay, I, I thought you said next week. Okay, next meeting. So there's no time constraints for that. We're good right now. It should be fine. Yeah, it has to be it's in May. Free. Oh, okay. All right. I'm just. That's why I'm, yeah. I want. That's why I want to see this. They again. asked us yeah. to do it before their next board meeting, and usually they meet around the twenty first or in the twenties. So that the thirteenth should be fine for our Dharma the decision. Yep. I think that. Um, Water and sewer, we talked about doing after the uh, income meeting anyway, and before June 15th. So that could conceivably wait. Uh, you know, board retreat. Um, again, you know, some, some of these things are, are sooner than later, but you know, it, it, a week doesn't, I think, make the difference. Um, public hearings, we probably need a little bit of guidance from Ray, but I think he probably needs guidance from us too. So what our expectations are? Yeah, I, 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 I'm just, I just get nervous. The more we, I know we're meeting weekly, and you know, I was one of the ones who suggested that during this uh, crisis and pandemic, and and I'm totally okay with it. And I, I think it's, I'm, I, I'm, I think the public is happy that we're doing it. Um, I hope they are, and I'm glad we have, we're getting a lot of participate participation from command and, and board of health and I think it's really informative and I just I don't want to kick the can down the road too far even though it's two weeks and and then we have to start thinking about town meeting we're going to have a lot in our plate on how we you know even though that discussion is the end of May I was hoping it wouldn't be that long and and other things too that if we don't meet next week and even try to cover half of these and not knowing what else is going to come up. Or maybe we cherry pick, cherry pick a few of these off and make it a really focused meeting. I don't know if anyone's open to that, but you know, I, I want to go Tuesday night because I really want to get this public hearing thing. Uh, Wakefield is having full meetings every two weeks. They have not stopped town government during this uh, virus. So I'm not saying we have to do that, but we can't just keep on doing nothing. Um, we have really have to move the ball forward or we're just saying that, you know, have seven to 11 o'clock meetings for months and months and months. Um, so I would love to pick a few things off this list for next week. That's my personal opinion, but I'm one of five um, and just to move the ball forward. And I think public hearing Maybe we'll get some guidance Tuesday night. Maybe we won't from what other towns are doing. But I know for a fact Wake, Wakefield is having full hearings and, and getting things done. Um, but I'll leave it there. Mark, can I suggest that you discuss this with Bob and see what's reasonable and yep. move it forward from there? Yep, again, we're fine. going around in circles. Yep, yep. I think that's fine. Okay, and any other last opinions? And then uh, I'll take it offline. No, nope. okay. Um, I think we've covered everything we plan to for the evening. Carlo, do you have a, a motion? What's today's date again? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta check my phone, 29. <laughs> Sorry, M motion to adjourn the meeting on April 29th. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. Okay, rolling around the circle. Karen. Um, I, oh, yes, to adjourn. <laughs> yes, I. <laughs> Anne. Yeah. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. We are adjourned. Thank you.